did one which was going to be universally received and popular. I would like to do one video where I didn't know that going in, I was going to make more people upset with me than I was going to make actually want to like me and watch my videos. Because this video starts off with, from the beginning, with... Well, how do I put this politely? With Tillman. Let's let's be honest. That's starting off is already not going to make it a happy video for some people. Um, there are few people who are quite so. How do I put this politely? Um, well, he's a product of his system. He's a product of his age, and even then, he manages to stand out as being someone who's a mahusive, mahusive. Example of port barrel politics and um, language which I cannot use with my little cousins watching. Hello, everyone. One of the senators in Ilburn, uh, Tillman was at the Washington Naval Treaty has begun. We can now all worry. I'm certainly worried. This is definitely not the topic I wanted a, a topic to make new friends, as I've said repeatedly, and I'm going to keep saying it because it won't make me friends. <laughs> Also, the route I've gone in this video, I must admit, is not going to make me friends. Um, and I mean that in the nicest possible way. But, it's... Um, how do I put this politely? I've had to go the way I think it goes. And the way I think it goes is not exactly the way a lot of people are going to be necessarily following along with it. Because I've followed the evidence. And the evidence for me strongly suggests, and I'm just going to put this notification up on Twitter because we started a bit late, that uh, things are going to get interesting because there's lots of people here talking about Japan. And that's fine. Talk about Japan. That's, it's always good. It's always good to talk about Japan. But Japan doesn't matter as much to... Tillman as it does to others. It really doesn't. In fact, you could almost say that for Tillman, Japan is secondary to the most important criteria of his life. And I'll be going through this. I'm going to have to go through a lot about Tillman to make this make sense. Because Tillman is in many ways the linchpin. And there are many others who fight a rearguard action after he goes. And they do very well. Thank you very much. They do very well. But, and they are just as interesting individuals as Tillman is. They really are just as interesting uh, uh, individuals as Tillman is. In fact, some of them are even more interesting than Tillman is. Some are downright sods. But, yeah, we are starting off with Tillman, and I am just putting out the various tweets and things. I have got to get a system to set up to this. People told me that if I get a Steam, a Steam Deck, a Stream Deck or Steam Deck, whatever it's called. A Stream Deck, I think it is. Um, not a Steam Deck. I think a Steam Deck is a computer game system. A Stream Deck is what I talk about. A little sort of control system. I can set up macros which do it all for me. Um, which is, therefore, now on the... What I am colloquially informed, because... I love it. I had a chat with some students the other day who apparently watch a lot of streaming, a lot of streaming content on YouTube, etc. It's called that a stretch goal for a fundraising event, and I'm sort of going, I don't do that. And there was a suggestion of why don't I do a history uh, a fun? And I went, I did sort of try one of those. I'm not going there to try too many of them, but um, yeah, goodness gracious me, they were having fun the other day. But no, it's a, it's it's going to be um, it, it it it's something I'm going to have to sort of look into working out at some point, because I have to do this, I do this all manually at the moment. So if you are watching any of the social medias where I advertise this stuff up, you'll know exactly what's happening. Because well. It'll be starting to uh, blow, uh, appear on your screen as we speak. Posting. Right then, and final one. 
Oh, good lord, I give myself way too much effort on this front. I should, I should just give up. I should just give up with the social media as it is. I should really give up with the social media as it is. I should so give up with the social media as it is. How the frick? Oh, that's just... That's, I've taken me ages to find Facebook at that point. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to change my page. Because I have a page on Facebook where I um, like to post things. And yeah, let's put it up on... Apparently page health is good. No idea what page health means, but it's just telling me page health is good. Yeah, page health is good. Let's post that. Everyone can see it. Done. All done. Good. All done. Yes, I have been enjoying the clips you've been sending on Instagram. Sorry if I haven't been responding, but... <sighs> this week has been a sea of, well... Mm, too many vegetables and a lot of estate agents. And sorting out lawyers and other things. Because we've, as I think I've told you, we've placed a... A thing on our house. It's been accepted. But we've got to now make sure we have all the notes and all the required legal documents. And some of them were supposed to be ready and weren't ready. And it's fun. Well, let's see. So, now, hello Peter Dawson, hello Knights of Glade 1, hello Jacob, hello Leslie Mitchell, hello Michael Cooch, hello Paul Amos, hello Blackman Maximus, hello Abuseski, hello Calvin Gersberg, Michael Cooch, uh, Paul Amos, hello. DG, uh, DH89, hello, DGV40, hello, Just Funk, hello, David Golding, hello. And um, I'm not going to name who, hello, new, new IKB4472, and Jacob, W5570. Hello, everyone. I'm not going to name names, but I will tell you there have already been four submissions for the competition. Four submissions have already come in, and they're having fun. I need a social secretary, I need something. I have community guidelines. I probably do somewhere. Sorry, I just saw a note from YouTube going, Welcome to live chat. Remember to guard your privacy and abide by our community guidelines. Oh, they have community guidelines, don't they? Yes. And I have community guidelines in that I have little cousins watching who are under 16. As far as their parents believe, they do not know swear words. So please do not use them in the chat, because then their parents will blame me for them learning them. When we all know the truth... But that doesn't matter. The truth does not matter in this circumstance. All that matters is they will have someone they can blame for their children learning words which they probably heard when they dropped something on their feet. But still doesn't matter. They will blame me. <laughs> and I'm outnumbered. So, no swear words, please. <laughs> Hence we do Frigate. <laughs> we'll do it live. Yes, Frigate will do it live. Yeah. Um... <sighs> Oh, it was quite funny. Is one of my one of my students after watching the uh, YouTube short I did the other day, where I had meant absolute, I said discussed absolute Kelvin, and they said, "Didn't that other lecture the other day when you call them an absolute frigging Kelvin, think it was a compliment?" Yes, they did. And they will hopefully never watch my shorts. <sighs> You saw it. When in doubt, don't say don't send curses, send frigates. Hello, Melanie. Hello, you slid, uh, you saw D. And hello, everyone. Right then. So, what if Senator Tillman was at the Washington Naval Tree? Now, I've taken a slightly different route. I've already seen in chat some people going, well, you know, what's his, delega uh, what's his route? You know, is he there at the treaty? Is he a delegate? I don't think he would actually be a formal delegate. He wouldn't be a formal delegate. He's not that kind of person. Okay? We consider who the formal delegates were, and we have discussed this before on this channel this channel and other scenarios. The actual delegates and their roles of being there, they're all very much official. The, le the Senate majority leader, the Senate minority leader, those sort of things. But I think he'd be there. And I'll get into how I think he'll be there and what he'll be doing, but... Tillman is a man who is a art and negotiator who works in the background. Okay? Tillman is a man who rigs his elections by finding something which smears the opponents and sinks them before they even get to elections. He likes to have 
saying that, you know, basically he likes to deal with things not by public discussion, and dis uh, discussion, destruction. He likes a quiet word in here as well. Of course, if you continue down this route, this might well come to light. And this might well come to light. But of course, if you in back out now and endorse me, things will be perfect. That's how Mel Tillman does things. So, please... Don't think of him as being a delegate. And I wasn't going down that route immediately. What if Senator was at the Washington Naval Treaty? Specifically doesn't say delegate. And it, you know, survives into the 1920s. What does the Washington Treaty look like? He's not going to be a signatory delegate. He's If he's there, he's going to be visiting. He's going to be walking around. There is no way you are going to keep him out of that building. Or out of the discussions. But he has got his own agenda. And you have to remember, he is very skilled at getting his agenda through. Now, Knight 6831, again, you are off base quite a long way. When you say Tillman is focused on the British. No. Tillman uses the British to justify the construction he wants to construct. Or the Japanese, depending on which group he's talking to. He doesn't care. I'll be getting into this, but Tillman really doesn't care. Okay? Stop. Don't treat Tillman as a, a simple person. He's not. He is manipulative. He is far more Machiavellian. And whatever he's saying in a speech doesn't matter what he believes. He's saying what serves his interest in getting what he wants from the people he's talking to. So, this is the reality. Okay? So he's not a delegate in the way a second lieutenant outranks the, uh, uh, the regimental sergeant major. Yes. In that, um, oh, <laughs> no one's going to disagree with him. So, yeah. Frigate will do it live. And trouble is, I like that idea, but I need uh, I, I need to have the right sort of image to go with it. Frigate will do it live. I really need sort of one of these with an Age of Sail frigate on. Um, I'll think about it. I, I, I So far, I've tried to be doing some of these myself recently. See if I can do it, because I... The very nice person who's done them before for me, um, it seems to be very busy. And I don't want to put any more pressure on them, so I tried to do it myself. And so far, it's failed dramatically. Anyway, let's carry on. So, currently there's a competition. If you are watching this channel, which you hopefully will be, if you're, you know, you hopefully are watching this channel, I'd hope you're watching this channel now, and if you're watching our videos this channel, you will have noticed that I've been talking about a competition. And I've mentioned that the competition has had some entries come in. And those entries are very cool entries. I have enjoyed reading them. I have maybe shared some of them with my colleagues. And they have enjoyed reading them. And all of us are enjoying reading them. Well, that means the Naval History Writing Competition is still going. There is plenty of time. And let's be honest, what is a more appropriate topic to discuss that particular competition than this video? There is no video more appropriate to discuss this competition than this video, let's be honest. Uh, because it's all about looking at the history and working out where it would go. So if you go down to the description down below, you'll find a link to the competition. And the prize for the competition are my book. There are two of them, so two people can win a prize. There are details and everything's explained and a link below. Please do watch it if you haven't, and please do consider entering. It's a lot of fun, and so far, everyone who's writing something for it has been messaging me with, this is a lot more fun and a lot easier than I thought it was going to be once I got started. Leslie Mitchell. Tillman uses the language and example for his argument. Exactly. Tillman really doesn't care. Okay? 
don't... Let's put it this way. I, I, you find this very much... Uh, it's far more commonly understood and perceived today. But so for some reason, at some point, when we're looking back in history, we actually believe politicians when they're making a speech about these people are scary, these people are a major threat, da 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 da, da. We should be... You know, focus on that they actually, that's what they mean. Why do you believe politicians of the past are any more straightforward than politicians of today? Yes, there are some, just like there are some today. But they are very, very rare. And when you look at the rest of his actions, the way Tillman behaves in the rest of his life, you realise very quickly he'll say whatever he wants and whatever he thinks is best to get what he wants. He doesn't really care. So, Tillman, of course, is most famous for his battleships. Most famous because for his battleship proposals. But what is he talking about with those battleship proposals? What is he looking at? Well, people sometimes take the idea of the Tillman battleships as he wants to do these extraordinary battleships. I've done a whole video about them. It's not the case. It's not, he doesn't want to build an extraordinary battleship. He just wants to stop having incremental increases. He doesn't see the point in spending a whole amount of money to build a battleship only for it to be out uh, to be useless within two generations. People think about this as a competition with the British and competition with the Japanese. It is to an extent because that's who the qualitative race is going with. It's not a quantitative race. He's not talking about numbers of ships. It's qualitative race. And there's a reason Tillman wants out of the battleship race. It's because he wants cruiser production to be focused on. Remember, while the Americans are building up their battleships, they aren't building any frigating cruisers. They aren't building any cruisers. This is a problem for Tillman. It's not because he loves battleships or wants big battleships. He wants the battleship race to stop be over or at least be calmed down to the point at which everyone's going, oh, this is the biggest we can get, so we don't need to build any more. We just, we've got the R1s uh, of that, so we don't need to worry about it. No, he wants it to calm down so he can get more cruisers. Don Giovanni, that's the same about Tillman's Trooper. Yes. Yes. You know, nicest way, do not, there are very few, if you, if you think about number of people in this world today, you trust to say what they mean. And some of the people who do that literally are like myself and just can't be bothered to say anything else, even if it does upset people. I try and say it in the nicest possible way, but I'm still going to say it. And I hope that's how I come across. But there are far more people who will try and put the best spin on things for themselves. So he's a little like a current... Wait, uh, like a current? You mean like all the current candidates in the US presidential race? Not getting into it? No, no, but sorry. I get, don't get me started on modern politicians. It's not the topic of this video and I'm not getting into it. I would be rude about them all. They're all equally annoying at the moment. So, Tillman. Let's start looking at some facts about little old Tillman. He... How do I put this politely? He's a... He is an absolute glutamus maximus. Okay? He is an absolute glutamus maximus. If, if, anyone, if my cousins worry about my little cousins learning that phrase, then that's good. They've just learned the Latin for, the, for one of the largest muscles of the human body. In fact, the largest muscle in the human body. So yes, if they've learned that, then I'm proud of them learning the Latin for it. And I will take that, I will take that with pride. He served on the Committee for Naval Affairs from 1895, when he entered the Senate becoming its chairman in 1913, after already securing a naval shipyard in 1909, being built in Charleston, which frankly had no business having such a shipyard. There is no honestly good reason to build a shipyard in Charleston in 1909. There are other better places to build one. I know, because the US Navy was begging to build them there. His primary interests were South Carolina, Charleston Navy Yard in South Carolina, 
and prudential defence spending on everything that wasn't related to the economic prosperity of the first two. Please note again, prudential defence spending on everything that wasn't related to the economic prosperity of the first two. Now, he had been key to getting Colorado, Lexington class, not so keen, but had still been critical to getting the South Dakotas. Mostly this has been done for favours. Look at where the yard they're being built, which yards being uh, being uh, chosen. He likes to bank those favours. As long as they benefited South Carolina and himself and his own power base, in the end, he supported it. So he is viewing all this procurement around elections. Quite literally, when you consider some of the places he argues for where they're building ships... Then look at, and he's arguing in committee and very sometimes for yards to be selected for shipbuilding. Then look at the key target seats of the Democratic Party in those years. You find there's an amazing magical similarity going on. I don't know how it happens. This man is obsessed with two things. One, power. Two, having more of it. If you want to add in a third, see above. That is it. He is nasty. He is amoral. And I'm saying he's nasty because by our standards, he is a... He is virulently, virulently racialist. I'm not even going to go for purely... Uh, for just racist. Racialist we're going to go for. Uh, his faction includes someone who in the 1920s will actually actively oppose the Democrat Party's own candidate because he's a Catholic. And that guy is actually arguably nicer in some regards than Tillman. And I don't want to... Be, uh, in saying all that, he's still actually a very good senator if it comes from the point of view of the interests of South Carolina. He doesn't... Ca For him, there's everyone who isn't from South Carolina who's ranked, and then there's the people in South Carolina who's ranked. And their importance is, if you're a South Carolina, you're more uh, Carolinian, you're more important than anyone else. I might not like you because of what you are, but if you're from South Carolina, I'm looking after your interests before I care about anyone else's interests. And that's him. He is incredibly focused on the interests of South Carolina. And as I've said, the, he does support... The building program of those battleships. But one of the reasons he supports the building them, and one of the reasons he likes the South Dakotas being as slow as they are, and he doesn't push for the Colorados to be fast, faster, and he likes the Lexingtons the way they are, is because they don't enter. None of them are going to interfere with a cruiser build program, and he wants a cruiser build program. He desperately wants a cruiser build a build program. He lusts for a cruiser build program. He wants cruisers to be built in in South Carolina. He wants Charleston Navy Yard is literally being designed with the idea of cruisers in mind. They literally have slipways which are up to 170 metres long. Uh, no, 180 metres long. And if we consider most of the cruisers coming to spare are roughly 170, it's perfect. And he's working on bigger ones. It's got, it's gonna have, it's got plans for dry docks and all sorts of things. That's what he's focused on. Nice errand. The British have the most cruisers of anyone. They are planning the genera next generation of cruisers, which would be better than anything anyone else has. Because lessons of the um, AC PC fleet's operations. Mm, uh, I wouldn't quite say, but uh, carry on. There's lots of different different uh, operations for cruisers to come in. There's all sorts of different Harwich Force cruisers. There's all sorts of sources the British are mining for cruiser information. You you, you cannot limit it down to just two. Or two, even two groups within the cruiser force, or two sets of cruisers. You really can't. Those are proceeding clear. How can fast the most armor cruisers? Yeah, there's, there's, they are interested in cruisers, but and so Tillman will point to the British for cruisers because he wants to justify a cruiser program for the Americans, because they can build those in Colorado, in Carolina. So. Well, no, they don't have yards measured. I've just, I'm just using meters because it allows me to combine the French to everyone else. The, the people who work in yards are, um, well, are the Americans and the British occasionally. The British, even at this point, are starting to work to an extent in meters. It's kind of interesting. The British are sort of getting into the meter thing. Um, 600, 600 feet. 
along um, 90 feet wide is the lar is the largest of the shipbuilding way and there's two more which are 110 uh, which are 350 feet basically it's a destroyer and a crew a destroyer and um, a cruiser building facility that is what it is okay eventually it also works on submarines so it's not about big ships so big ships don't directly benefit him big ships benefit him if they bring in favors enjoy the pizza just funk and thank you richards hello thank you for having me No. Nice to don't think about it. If you're talking about something that size, the Hawkins class are already 184 meters. So they're already starting to be over the length of which he would like. He, uh, You know, 184 meters, which is... Um, 605 feet. So they're already getting a bit long for him liking. He, he would prefer to make the yard a certain way a little bit longer. Uh, if you're going for something that big, if you're really going for something that big in terms of tonnage, you could well be talking about something which is 800 feet or some region or 750 feet or something like that. Along, so basically, he's only going to be keen on cruisers that size if he has to invest. He can invest the money in the yard to grow the sides of certain ways, which he would get done if necessary. But mainly, he wants cruiser production. He wants cruiser production. Now, I have to say, this is a particularly interesting thing for me to look through. Because I have this suspicion, this strong suspicion, that certain things that get created and put in... Um, ...will be different. You know. Um... I, th I think, for starters, I have a strong suspicion whatever the treaty d gets done is going to have strong inclinations to maximize cruiser productions. But also, I want to return you to this. Tillman doesn't really build unconventionally, but he's prepared to go massive as long as he can, st he can fix things. So one of the things you should realize when you're looking at this is Tillman is not going to be one of those arguing for 35,000 tons. He's done enough studies, he's done enough work on it, that frankly, he doesn't. He isn't going to be one of those people who's going to go around going, yes, 35,000 tons, you can build a decent, a decent capital ship. He's going to consider that moronic. He's been talking about ships quite happily of up to... 80, 000, well, 73,000 tons, 80,000 short tons, etc. All those things. Quite happily in his designs. He's been looking at absolutely colossal vessels. You can't then expect him to go, you know what? I'm going to be happy with a tiddler. I'm going to think it's a sensible thing. Especially not with the British having hood. That is going to be his big problem. He is going to be focused on Hood. He is really going to be focused in on Hood. Absolutely, colossally focused in on Hood. And... That is a criteria which cannot be ignored in some regards. That is going to be something he's going to be thinking about more and more. 
I don't think that's going to affect necessarily his approach to certain items. But it is going to affect things. And I'm just, as we speak, I'm adding in another slide just to make sure I cover that in enough detail because I have been debating about whether to do so or not. And I decided while we were live to actually do that. So I've literally written a slide while live and I'm adding this in. Yeah, the joys of being a historian. It's made my slides disappear. That's annoying. Let's go to properties and let's sort those out. So, these are some of the uh, these are some of the things which you have to think about when we're thinking about Tillman. He's famous for these battleships, but in many ways, as I discussed when I did a video on the Tillman battleships, and I should probably put a link down below, but I'm not going to bother. There's you know you can find them in the key ships. They're key ships series one. They're ages ago, but I still stand by it as a good video. The thing is, these battleships were about him, in many ways, trying to push the navy to confront what was the reality. That they were trying to do a gradual escalation, and he wanted in many ways to dreadnought the British and every other one else by just jumping ahead and going, boom, this is the standard. Now everyone just calm down. We can build this. You can't match it. It's not really the reality because the British would have been able to do the infrastructure to match it and exceed it because the Americans would have had to, fit, to be able to deal with it, had to work out what to do with the Panama Canal. Whereas the British just had to build a bigger yard. Let's be honest, on the cost and difficulty of things, which is more difficult? Making the Panama Canal wider, the entire length of it, or just increasing the size of a shipyard, adding in an extra dry dock or uh, assembly, uh, assembly dock at Camel Lairs or somewhere like that. Which is a more difficult feat of engineering? I know it's going to cost money, but again, whilst it's a lot of money... It is a lot of money. In the 1920s Britain, especially pre-crash, when they are uh, basically deciding what they're going to spend their money on, in that they are still, to an extent, living quite free and happy, it's not going to It's not going to be an issue. Yes. Yes. Under the scenario of the post-treaties and the 10-year rule and those things, it's not likely to happen. But in a world without the treaties where they do disconstruction, the British are going to do that and not make too much of a sweat of it. It's going to be just a continuation of, oh, it's the continuation of the qualitative treaty, a uh, qualitative race. Okay, that's fine. Qualitative races do not, for some reason, have the same heat as quantitative races. When you're trying to match someone in numbers, that always has far more underlying tension and far more stress for both nations involved than a qualitative race. What's the issue of Panama Canal specifically locks around and everything else? Once you get above a certain time and size, it's not just the locks, uh, Sea Fort. It's also a uh, Canada Force. It's also the ability of um, aforementioned vessel to maneuver in the spaces of the Panama Canal. The British have the Suez Canal, but that just needs dredging. That that that's again annoying, but not massively difficult. It's one of those things of, for America, the Panama Canal is absolutely strategically essential. It's a strategic imperative. Uh, hood stand displacement? Well, for hood stand displacement, for that you have to you go to the Washington Naval Treaty text itself. And according to the Washington Naval Treaty, the RN, hood stand displacement was 41,200 tons. So, everyone who disagrees with that, uh, I, I don't care. That that's what's written in the treaty text. That is what Britain claims and is accepted in the treaty text. You might think you know better. You might believe you know better. You might actually know better. Doesn't matter. 
according to uh, the Washington Treaty. So therefore, as far as we are concerned, for the co uh, qu questions of this of uh, this particular discussion, it is forty one thousand two hundred tons. Uh, yes. It gets tight. It gets tight at points. So. All right. What is the main issue we have with this, all this taking place? Well, he dies in July 1918, age 70. This is after a very long time in in the Senate. I'm, when you uh, when I say he has um, layers and layers of material on people, he has material on their parents, on their grandparents. He's got a political machine which, whilst it's not. At its peak in 1918-19, when he's running for re-election, is still pretty darn strong. Still pretty darn strong. And probably, I think, in that election, would have won. I don't think it would have been as easy as it used to be, but you have to remember at this point, the Democrats pretty much have a lock on the seat. It's an absolute lock on the seat. So, as long as he survives the primary, he wins. And that basically requires him to be alive. Because the entire ground his opponent was making him was claiming he was ill. So, if he isn't ill, and if he does survive, then he gets... He probably gets, he gets elected. And he gets elected. Charles and the Ark could build cruisers. That's it. So. If he survives, the trouble is also it's not just surviving to be elected. You need to not just be in place for the election. You need to be in place for... The continuation... Of the period now, of what during the the in the treaty negotiations, and immediate implementation and implementation post the treaty negotiations, and you've got to be there for some of the embedding, and you've got to be powerful for the embedding, and one of the key reasons why politicians tend to run again, and run for office again, is because they want to embed what they've done in the previous term. It usually takes a term to get something implemented, and another term to embed it, so it actually has a chance to succeed. So, hello Runon, hello Richards, hello Dan Freeman, hello everyone. So what does he do? What does he? What's he got to do for? In simple terms, I think he's got to still be at least running for re-election in 1925, if not, and probably re-elected. I would say he has to live till about 1928. He has to live to the age of 80. Now, before people start getting upset with me about the idea of uh, octogenarian um, senators and septuagenarian senators, that will be nothing new even at this time, let alone today. So, no. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Sen the, Senate is, the, the Senate is usually fairly advanced in age. It's fairly normal for them to be so. It wouldn't be unusual. And if you consider with Tillman... If, and I still, they'll say this, if he is elected again and does another term and maybe a bit, well, he won't be that unusual. Well, not that unusual. Um, merely uh, roughly 33 years in office. He'd been the first elected to the Senate in 19, 1895. March 1895. And as said, he served till 
July 1918 when he died. Ash Kangaroo. One gets the impression of Tillman knew the importance of carriers later on down the line. It was said to scrap everything that isn't a carrier. I doubt he would have. For two reasons. One, carriers might be important in the 1940s, but in this period, they're really not. And I, and I suppose, wait, uh, let me explain this before I sort of upset people too much. Look at the aircraft flying off carriers at this period. We're talking about the Sopwith Cuckoo. I've done a discussion on them in the British Naval Aviation Development period and all things. Look at the aircraft which are flying off the British carriers, and the British had the best carrier aircraft in the 1920s, mainly because they had the most carriers and they're actually building a lot of them. Um, but they really do in the 1920s have a real edge in terms of the carrier design. Look at those and go, are you going to place all your faith in them in the 1920s? If you are, you were a visionary far beyond your t uh, far more of your, uh, beyond your time. But also, in the 1930s, you're likely to get crushed by someone who goes, well, you haven't got a battleship, so you can do what you like. And that's the real problem. You know, th that's the thing. The carrier might be the coming capability, but it's not the capability at that time. And the most powerful weapon for most carrier aircraft is being able to spot for battleship guns. At this time. So, what are we going to do? Now, the first issue comes before we even get to the treaty, because Tillman's successor in uh, William Christie Bennett uh, was not as interested in naval power as it was possible, and also didn't really seem to understand the importance of the politics to the rest of... Um, how do I put this? Didn't understand it to um, its importance compared to the rest of the state. He was far keener on being chairman of the Committee of National Banks, and he was far keener on being a well, how do I put this? Being a lawyer. The next successor of Tillman, who Bennett was appointed to cover him while he were when he died. Um, how do I put this politely? He was just useless. Um, as an actual senator, he was again focused on banks, but again obsessed with his own law career. One of the interesting things I would like to point out here is, by and far, Tillman, of the next three in a row, uh, and the two, two successes, is the most career politician of the lot. Yet he is the least focused in terms of... Uh, he's also the most focused on delivering for South Carolina and actually realising what it needs. As far as he's concerned, banking doesn't employ enough people. And there wasn't enough industry. You needed to boost employment. You needed to boost enough people to get the vote to get the people in there who would then vote for you. That was what he cared about. The next senators who come after him are not of Tillman. They they might be nicer in in some ways, but they are not of Tillman's caliber and understanding. But there is a reason I have the Omaha class up here because I want you to have a look at this class. This class are. 7,620 tons in standard. They are armed with 12 6-inch guns. They have a length of 170 meters. Considering what I told you earlier, have a look at these ships and tell me what is missing from this list. What is not there? And I will wait. give the chat a few, a few seconds to catch up. Um, Todd Webb, that's not correct. Um, Tillman, how do I put this? Yes, they had changed to public vote, public election, 
But Tillman still won that because it was uh, it was a Democrat state, and he won the Democrat. Uh, as long as he won the Democrat par- uh, primary, he was fine. Um, so yeah, I, I I know why you're saying that, but Todd, you, you are right about the beginning of his career, wrong about his uh, most uh, about the rest of his career. So we have Norfolk construction from Plainswalk. Charleston Shipyard. Where Charleston Cruisers from Arhanas. Yes, that is correct. There are no Charleston Cruisers. Do you imagine <laughs> in any world where Tillman is still alive that the Navy orders a load of cruisers and they are not building any in Charleston? Anyone here on this chat believe that the U.S. Navy, with, Ch- with Tillman as its chair of its Navy- naval committee, and the and maneuvering as he does in the Senate and all these other things, uh, there uh, that they would manage to get through an order procurement of cruisers and not build any in his Charleston. Nineteen sixty-four again. You care about them not being uh, them being not as good maybe as the C, D, and E class cruisers. That's not as important to Tillman as where they are built. Yes, he preferred they were probably better and you know slightly better ships, but more importantly, he's going to care about where they are built. Also, please notice again. What are all these states? Washington State. That's a, a northern state. It tends to not be, well, in this period, in terms of senators. Uh, how do I put this politely about them? Um... If you go to look up the um, senators from Washington in this period, there is a Clarence Dill who gets there in 1923. I'm sure it has nothing to do with the ships being built there. And it was a key a key election point at certain points, but he had got elected in 1920. He got elected in... 1922-ish. Uh, the thing is... How do I put... How do I, how do I say this? Uh, if it's a Republican state... Tillman doesn't want anything built there. Tillman cares about two things. One, South Carolina, and two, getting re-elected. And he doesn't get favours from Republican senators. He gets favours from Democrat senators. And his voters having jobs that depend on him being a powerful force in federal government. Bingo, Don Giovanni. If he's a powerful force there, then they're going to they're going to get there. They're going to vote for him if he's bringing them in work. You're building no, you're building sixteen cruisers. There'll be three will be in Charleston. I have a feeling that Charleston would get at least two. Uh, it wouldn't be quite this many. It, it, they would probably be getting more cruisers. The Omaha class are, well, let's be honest, in many ways they are a um, the American equivalent of the E class in that they're trying out a six inch turret, but they're not sure the six inch turret is going to work, so they're trying out some casemate guns as well, some, you know, traditional gun, uh, gun positions as well. It's a bit weird, but it's a logical design, but you don't intend to build. 13 of an experimental class. You tend to build one or two, and then once you're happy if design works, then you build more of the rest. Uh, 
Uh, Massachusetts is just... I... Massachusetts is... Um... How do I put this politely? It's just below North New Hampshire. It's the sixth smallest state. And they're getting... A whole load. A whole load of them. And then there's Philadelphia. Which is, of course, in Pennsylvania. They're all above the Mason-Dixon line, yes. Trayman, hello. Are the lives before or after long patrols? The lives come before the long patrols. And usually, um, what I treat is sort of the live is sort of the seminar version of the lecture, which is long patrol. And I usually do the lives before the long patrol because then if people put any questions underneath the comment uh, comments underneath the live after I've done it, then when I record the long patrol, which is now from now, I'm going to go out the following Saturday. Not the next Saturday, not the Saturday of the week, but the next week Saturday um, after the after live, I have time to make sure I've you know answer some of them. So, and basically, also it's it's great fun because me and me I get instant feedback and I get to have chats with people, and that's the thing I miss most from having more hours at university is the actual chats with the students and discussing the things. Now, if someone wanted to suggest to give Tillman a plan to build a sixteen thousand ton cruiser in South uh, in South Carolina, in Charleston, and could actually make the yard to be able to do that, which you could to an extent do if you were prepared to play around with things and actually invest some money, then I'm sure he would be interested in Black Bear Maximus. But you know. That's the thing. You have to first tell him how you're going to do it. Because he has to know it's going to employ his critical people. So, before we even get to the treaty, there is going to be changes. There are going to be some of these, this class are going to be built in South Carolina. Are going to be built in Charleston. It's just going to happen. One problem is that some states, uh, let's say, just practice some interesting... Uh, uh, choosing sentences is interesting. Oh, I know. I know. And in... this, is The point I tried to make about Tillman is the Democrats have a very firm lock on Carol South Carolina at this point. And as long as you win the primary, you're going to win. And you basically... He wins the primary. Whilst it's theoretically moved from being... Um, state assembly appointed etc it's to being different in that this, this, that's, this is how he works this is how he gets elected he, he primaries them he destroys his competition in the primary I'm not going to see Quebec about South Carolina except in terms of getting elected let's put it this way yes in terms of getting elected but also how do I put this politely? Um, he cared about his legacy in South Carolina. He wanted to leave South Carolina richer and stronger than it was before. He felt, and I, and this is one of the things I do think he does, because he says it in front of multiple groups, even sometimes in groups which it wouldn't win him support in front of, is that he feels that South Carolina was hugely wronged in the Reconstruction era, and that they were truly not, you know, supported. You still have a 10 to 20 year gap in cruise technology. The thing is, again, Tillman doesn't care about that, Knights of the one. I know you care about that. I know we probably care about that. I know a lot of the US Navy at the time probably cared about that. But Tillman doesn't care about that. What Tillman cares about is where the ships are being built. What Tillman cares about is whether this is going to get the Democrats elected as a wider group, and especially is this going to get him re-elected. That is what he cares about. Yes, he cares about the security of America to an extent, and yes, if he could build a better cruiser, he would do. And you can imagine, if the nicest way, if 
they're building the Omaha class, and the British are building the Hawkins class, etc. And they're coming out, and he's looking at them. And he goes aboard a Hawkins class. You can imagine what the next naval committee hearing's going to be like. Basically, there's going to be a U.S. Navy officer and the U.S. Navy's, the Bureau of Ships, the, uh, the Admiral in charge of the Bureau of Ships is going to be sitting in front of him crying by the end of it. But that's going to wait till Tillman walks on a Hawkins class. Until he sees a Hawkins class in person, because he's very much a, he has to see in person to believe it. He doesn't really take pictures sometimes for granted. When he walks on one, at that point, the moment he walks aboard one, there is going to be a U.S. Navy officer crying in front of him at a Senate hearing. And again, if you don't think that's actually the case, look up some of the recording, uh, some of the uh, notes and diary uh, things of the some of the Senate hearings he presided over. He he was he was nasty when he wanted to be. So, he's alive. He has changed the Omaha construction, so there's more of those coming through. And the Washington Naval Conference begins in 1921 to 1922. It's a full year of conferencing. Again, it's a full year of conferencing. There is a long-term discussion going on here, and it's in between the delegations and multiple levels. So again, it's not like anyone can come up with... If you've got someone like Tillman in there, who is good at manipulation, who loves doing backroom deals, they can achieve a tremendous amount. In fact, the longer a negotiation goes on, the more personalities like that will, come, will achieve their ends. In short-term negotiations, which have very little time for people to build... How do I put this? Uh, personal bonds. Things are different. Now, I will add something. I've described Tillman as a racialist. Very much so. And honestly, yes, he's not keen on any foreigners. He's not quite Admiral King over the UK, but he's not keen on any of them, really. I have said, yes, he picks and chooses which is the greatest enemy and threat, depending on what he's arguing for. Do I think he would work with the uh, with the British Commission if he thought he would serve his interests? Yes. Do I think he would work with the Japanese delegation if he thought it served his interests? Yes. Would he serve the, work with the French and the Italian delegations if it served his interests? You can bet that. Okay. The one thing that comes through with Tillman is in many ways he is a reprehensible person. And I'm sure behind their backs he'll be merrily being rude about all of them. Using all the names he can think of. But he is quite capable of holding his tongue. Sucking it in. Shaking their hand. And smiling to their face while planning how to stab them in the back. He is more than capable of that. He is a consummate backroom professional. And the thing is, he heads a rather large group of Democratic senators who are very pro-naval construction. And so, <coughs> he has excuse me, a lot of power. He has a lot of influence in that regard. And that's what he has to treat it as. My goodness, he hates you, but will gladly use you for all your worth. Exactly. Again, please. The amount of times I see some people in history written off, and they go, well, you know, they have this view. Yes, he had that view. He was ardent of that view. But he would put that view to one side if he thought you would serve his interests. And what are his interests? What's his faction coming to the Naval Conference? They're coming to the Naval Conference to get what they want out of this. They want re-election. Re-election means they want jobs. Jobs means they need ships to be built. Okay? 
If you can't build ships, or if you don't build ships at the moment, you cannot preserve jobs. If you can't preserve jobs, you lose elections. This is the thing he understood, which the next generation of very banking-influenced senators seem to have un misunderstood. And you can argue that's what led to a lot of the issues in the, in the Depression, Great Depression, but also has led to a lot of issues with the various crashes we've had over the years. You can always tell when people who understand that employment is what gets them elections, rather than a lot of money in the economy, are in power. And it doesn't matter which side of the political line they come from. Please note, both sides are equally silly sometimes. Money in the economy is great. It creates many rich people, a lot of money for services. And those sort of things which you can use and you can highlight and who will give you donations for elections. Employment in the economy is better. When... Bill Clinton famously said, it's the economy stupid. What he really should have said is, it's employment stupid. Because this is what the, the senators of Tillman's generation really understood, and the next generations who came after him didn't understand. They don't seem to have understand. They are obsessed with money, not employment. Now, saying that, though... You have to remember, Tillman didn't want to keep having qualitative race. He didn't want to have capital ships under massive construction. He wanted a ceiling, he wanted the capital ships finished, and he wanted to concentrate on cruisers. I can smile, murder while I smile, and wet my cheek with artificial tears. Richard III, according to Shakespeare. Yeah. Richards. Uh, the people hate, uh, he was dealing with hating him in the exact same way for the exact same reasons. Yeah. It isn't, but it's different. I would argue that mm, there were a lot, of, there was a lot less animosity between some of the delegations at, than Tillman would have had. My honest, the term is pragmatism. He'll shoot the other guy in the back, but he won't kill himself over ideology. Yeah. So this is the thing, you've got this faction now coming in, and they're going to be quite a powerful faction, because not only do they have experience, if Tillman's there, they still have a very experienced linchpin in their group. But you're talking about a dozen to two, a dozen of, a dozen senators. If a dozen senators are working towards the end of giving themselves jobs and winning elections and re-elections with, em with employment... Well, that's going to affect things. That is going to affect things. And so what are Tillman's domestic targets going to be? Well, I have pictured above here USS Tillman, a Wix-class destroyer. Name for Tillman. He already had a destroyer picked out a name for him. Now, what will Tillman's targets be? Domestically, the Lexington class. There are two Virginia ships in the Lexington class being built in Virginia. Under Senator Claude Swanson of Virginia, 1910 to 1933 he serves. Uh, he and when, in 1933 he became the 45th Secretary of the Navy. Swanson is an ardent navalist. Because again, it gives a lot of employment in his... In his... State. It's his seat. I'm not sure what you're responding to, Knights Exo, everyone. But, the, again, this is... The, the criteria is you're talking about Tillman. And you... Tillman is... 
you're very passionate and very interested in naval start, uh, naval history and naval things for the, uh, and the balance of the powerful navies. And that's what you're interested in. That's not what Tillman's interested in. That's not what Tillman cares about. Colorado class. USS Washington probably still doesn't survive, as New Jersey has Republican senators, so does not care, unless it makes the case for something else. South Dakota class. California is a key election target in 1920, which means Newport News, North Carolina, uh, Senator Leave S. Oman, and um, uh, uh, Senator Funfield, M. Simmons, both Democrats, key Democrats. Um, Norfolk Navy Yard, both Virginia, again, Senator, uh, Senator Claude A. Swanson and others, and whoever the other Senator of Virginia, doesn't matter, they will back up Swanson on this issue. And Mayor Island, California, are political targets. This means he would like to save or a place on those slips. So those ships either have to be saved or they have to be replaced. So that means the targets from the South Dakota class are South Dakota, Indiana, Montana, and North Carolina. That's what he wants to save. Because those are that. The construes the construction? Well... He wants cruisers construction to start up immediately, and he will want something better than the Omaha class to be coming along. And... Well... It's worthwhile realising about Senator Swanson that he's almost single-handedly responsible for the fact that Maryland and West Virginia were two of the three Colorados completed. Pretty much the moment that he knows that one of the Colorados has to go, Washington's got a target on its back and he takes it out. Think about that. He's a senator who solo manages to pretty much veto a ship named USS Washington. Named officially for Washington State, but also for George Washington the President, let's be honest, because that's what the state's named for, and also the national capital. And a senator from Virginia is powerful enough to veto it. And the thing about this is, the beauty about all this is, yes, there are arguments here going that he has to give them something. Well, the thing he's giving them is the treaty, because the Republicans have argued for the treaty because they don't want war with Britain and Japan. The Republicans are actually arguing for a treaty. So the actual very existence of the treaty itself is what he's giving the Republicans. He will argue strongly against any treaty. He will be virulently opposed to the treaty. Just so his conceding is what he gives to Republicans. I got jobs in, in, insert name here, is literally one of the most important things politicians represent in that area anywhere in the world. Kind of has to be if they want to be re-elected. Exactly. Now, the thing is, these will be his domestic targets. Those are what he wants to do. Those are what he wants. <sighs> it becomes more of an issue, though, once you start to get the external points of discussion. Hood. The British aren't going to sacrifice her, and Tillman personally doesn't like battle cruisers. I'll point this out because earlier, because he always does battleships. You notice he never pushes a battle cruiser design. 
She's about 40, 41,200 tons on standard. The thing is, he's not going to want her to be out on her own in front of the world by that massive a capability. Now, again, this is a point of discussion because, again, it comes up and it's interesting in the chat's already got us. A war between Britain and America. Was it a high likelihood? Please note, there is a reason I argue it wasn't a high likelihood, and I, will, I have a good argument for this. Before wars become a high likelihood, you start to see certain things. People get promoted away from places. For example... For the entirety of the 1920s and 30s and into World War II, one of Britain's largest yards, which was key for not just sh uh, warship construction, but also for <sighs> turbine construction, for boiler construction, Browns is actually run by an American. Okay? It's one of the key yards the directors of naval construction work with. For a large chunk of the 1920s and 30s, uh, are, they have a constant exchange program running between the and naval constructors. So, and then there's exchange programs of officers and all sorts of things going on. So whilst, yes, you can say war can break out between anyone, people like to point out British were making ship visits in, etc. to Germany before war broke out, etc., Try and find a German in charge of a British yard in 1910, let alone 1914. Try and find a German, a British person in, in charge of an Amer a German yard in 1910, let alone 1914. However, you can find British architects and British, uh, British mm, constructors, uh, one, for one of a phrase, in charge of American yards right through the 1920s and 30s and have been in there since the 1900s. And before that, and uh, you can find American ones over here for that whole period. So my view is always, whilst there are a lot of issues which Britain and America find annoying about each other, on the balance, each other is more useful as an ally and working with each other. There's always more benefit for them working with each other than fighting each other. And neither side ever really wants to do it. They have plans for it because they're each the biggest power at the time. But no. It's not that sort of level. It's not that sort of scenario. So, no. And this is another point to make about it being a qualitative race. Between Britain and America, it's a pure qualitative race. It's more a race, therefore, for national pride over who has the biggest, sexiest ship on the block, rather than we can actually beat you. It's one of the reasons why you never see the... Even when the Americans are ordering mass numbers and going, we're going to be building all these ships, the British are going... Yeah, we're not announcing a mass construction program. We're just going to keep building our be the best ships and, you know, not really worry about it too much for a bit. We don't have to worry about it until you've built something which en masse can beat the R-Class and the Green Lizards. How's your tune? How do they trust done? My good, if there was a constant exchange of naval constructors, how did the British manage to sneak water-based armor through you without the US realizing? No one ever asked the right questions. <laughs> That's it. And also, the Americans were experimenting with something similar, and they didn't think it could work. The British managed to make it work. There are... And, you know... If you consider some of the stuff which is actually built at Brown's Yard, etc., at that time, if the Americans had actually bothered to ask anyone... If the British had managed to make it work. They'd have soon found out it had been made to work. But they didn't ask the question. And we can start in that. Because also. The British continue with the 18 inch torpedo. Which does fit with certain with their aviation profile. Because of making it easier for it to um, belly flop etc. When they're doing the night, uh, their sort of their attacks. From their torpedo bombs. And they're using their tension wire and all those things. But the Americans of course. Work on a far bigger torpedo to do that with. Uh, it never, it doesn't actually work in that profile. It doesn't, of course, have a tension wire. But for the aerial torpedo, the Americans work on the largest aerial torpedo in terms of size and damage any navy in the world is using in the beginning of World War Two. And it would have been really, and the British could have asked about the sort of the Americans doing that, but the British weren't really interested, so they didn't ask the questions. But that would be an interesting thing. 
Next one, the Americans are recalled from uh, Drac think, think the all-forward armament isn't workable. Yeah. The Americans don't think the all-forward armament is workable. The British do. So, you know, th what you're dealing with is some t is to get this information, you actually... This is also another reason why I don't take it as serious. Because if it had been a serious... If there had been a likely threat or even a poten real potential of threat of war, there would actually be a proper intelligence gathering procedure going on in Britain or, or on America and America on Britain. Um, you know, sort of... Amer uh, there'd be an actual intelligence go process going in America for Britain and Britain for America. And they would have found that they would have found that out because they would have been asking those questions. The moment you're not actually asking those questions, it shows it's not actually a real risk of war. Broadbald Gunnarism. Chance of war if America starts tugging on Britain's um, Britain over. Uh, Broadbald Gunnarism. I do like the question, but please note. My little cousins watch this channel, so I have to be very careful in my language. By little cousins, I mean under 16s, and whilst they might know the language, if um, I say it on the channel or say the things on the channel, and they uh, then it will they, their parents will blame me for them learning it rather than any other scenario. So, chance of war, of war if America starts pulling the um, debt accrued during the war? Well, A, the debt accrued during World War One is nowhere near as massive as it is during World War Two and Great Depre uh, the, all the sort of things that happen after that. Um, Britain actually has far more debt to its various Commonwealth um, Empire members, Dominion members, at that time. And also, I would say the trouble for America at that point is that Britain goes, well, yeah, then you can go and do the patrolling. America doesn't want to be the world's policeman in 1920s and 30s. They are happy for Britain to be the world's policeman. So if they start pulling on the debt, then there's a problem. And, you know, there's also the fact that you can... Uh, the the debt is all written up legally. There's there's all sorts of rules. Yes, there are positions they can start pull, uh, maybe start trying to pull in and demand in, but if they don't have reason to, and they're doing it illegally, then Britain could refuse to pay it. And then how do you enforce it? By declaring war? And then who's the bad guy? You try if Britain, especially if Britain's publishing it. And one trouble, the other trouble for America and Britain with both of each other as nation is they are two nations separated by a common language, so it's very easy for press stories in one to get translated across to the other and, back, uh, and vice versa. So you try and if you, America, you try and say something like, like the America, uh, the British are doing this on their scenario, uh, you know, aren't paying their debt, and the British have lots of articles saying they are it's going to become mixed. And America wasn't as... It's going to sound strange. America was isolationist in the 20s and 30s, but it wasn't as insular as it is today. I, I have a lot of friends who travel through America and have commented on various things that when they hear world news come up on the news and it's talking about California or something like that, and it's sort of a case of that's not really world news. Um, that's, that's still domestic. Uh, there are, I'm not sure, the thing is America is so vast in itself and has so many people and there's so much going on that I can understand why in the limited broadcast of news and limited time you have for news, they don't get on to the world as much as they used to. But again, it used to be the fact that newspapers were the great source of this. And these days, newspapers are mostly, uh, mostly as I see them, especially the physical ones, just sources of advertisement. So, again, I can see where that's gone. That's just, that's the reality. Ah, uh, Dracon, then the 14 points, and Britain ignored it, and the country went and sort of full on how on extorting money for... Ah, uh, Britain, and countries went full on and extorting money for... Yeah, Britain basically... Uh, the the. The fact is that Britain ignores quite a lot of what America does when it's annoying for them, and Wilson's 14 points have no impact, largely speaking, on the world. My friend, the thing about that is if you owe the bank a mill, you have a problem with them. You owe a few billion, you might own the bank. Yeah, that is another scenario. If the Americans start causing troubles and the British refuse to pay, then there's all sorts of issues in their own financial system. Um,
Yeah. Britain doesn't call in the debt because of trade reasons, and it's dissimilar from American America. There are lots of trade... Uh, th this is one of the other things which often have gone about World War One. Britain had lent to a lot of people. A lot of the French debt was to Britain. And it, uh, it's one of the interesting, fun conversations you sometimes get into with people about um, the fact that you could point out there are certain countries today who owe a lot of money to other countries. Uh, one of them is Britain's own next-door neighbour, which pretty much the British government owns because they own all their debt. Because it's cheaper for that go uh, that company uh, go government to get debt and get loans through Britain than it is for anyone else due to traditional reasons. But uh, uh, due to tradition, uh, you know, historic reasons and British government being basically, it's useful for us to have that leverage. So, Hood is there. Hood is there. And, um... It does... Does provide some interesting characteristics. It does provide some interesting characteristics. So, Washington Naval Treaty. The trouble is when the Washington Naval Treaty comes in, and I'm trying to leave time for a long discussion, because I think there will be a long discussion about this this evening on the, on the live. So I'm trying to get through the 21 slides, roughly, in about the two and a half hour mark. So we've got half an hour for a discussion before I head over, over to Discord. Yeah, but um, they do. They, uh, they do, but um, I'm not getting into too much. It's not just <laughs> it's not just Ireland, <laughs> though. There are there are it, let's put it this way: there are quite a few countries like that around the world. When you look at them, their their major next door neighbour owns all their debt because it's easier for the small country to get debt at a serviceable, manageable rate if their next door neighbour gives it to them at a, that the rate the same rate they would take on debt. And if that helps provide a more stable next door neighbour, that's in the interest of the country which is providing the service. Um, so that's the reason you do it, but it only works as long as that country... They, that country doesn't have to cut off existing debt, it just has to say, we won't help you anymore, to cause massive problems. Or even demure on the subject, and go, well, we actually need to consider this before we help you with getting more debt. Dr. Alex148, I like how I search Dr. Alex148 and get this live. Hello. Hello, another Dr. Alex. Um, isolation is not realistic, but we still were. Yeah, it's a fun thing. Now, Hawkins class are a model for the cruisers of the Washington Treaty. Without many people in the Washington Treaty ever set eyes on them, and I already sort of come to set to come this view that you know if Tillman actually walks on a Hawkins class. He is going to rip a U.S. naval officer to pieces. Uh, if we consider the Bureau of Ships. Uh, oh, ships. Um, um, well, the Bureau of Construction and Repair, as it was in this period. Uh, in this period, we're talking about between... 1914 to 1922, you've got Rear Admiral w, David W. Taylor, and then you've got 1922 to 29, Rear Admiral John D. Burrett. Whether he sees a Hawkins class, and we have to remember, the Hawkins class, eh, I don't think any of them make to the States because until about 1924. I'm not 100% sure. Um... Hawkins and Raleigh could have made it there for the actual, for the uh, for the actual uh, for the actual things going along, uh, but yeah, I, I I don't think they did necessarily. Um, I think they made it later. I think it would have been John D. Burrett who would have had the interesting discussion as head of the Bureau of Construction uh, Bureau of Construction and Repair with Tillman in the Naval Senate Naval Committee over why the frigate the British have better ships than we do. 
Thank you, Dr. Ox. I will probably subscribe. I will uh, subscribe to you if uh, after this is over as well, because you know, Dr. Alexis should support each other. <laughs> there could be more than two soon. That there's a few others of us around there, and there are some more who are working on their doctorates. Lots of topics are going to have Dr. Alex's to look after them. Um, now, enjoy the fluff walking time, Sim Richards. I think the answer from Burret would have been, well, we need to build some cruisers. And I think the Washington Naval Treaty, I think as far as cruisers go, could be interesting. I think it could be interesting, especially with convergence. I don't see much changing. I don't see much changing, but I'm going to start with likely changes to the Treaty of Capital Ships. And it starts off with very simply. Now, I'm going to say this. The United States may complete and retain two ships of the West Virginia class and three of the South Dakota class. Why are they getting three of the South Dakota class? Anyone want to guess? Well, there's a reason for it. There is a reason for it. If we consider you've got, well, Norfolk Naval Shipyard, Newport News Shipyard, uh, Shipbuild, uh, Newport, um, Norfolk, Mare Island, and Newport News, right? So, A, I think they might be called the Montana class. But also, I think the odds are Montana, North Carolina, and Iowa get completed. Those are key Democrat state areas. Those are key Democrat seats. Norfolk, of course, is Virginia. And, well, Mare Island is California, which is a key target seat at this point. And Newport News is also is in Chesapeake, North Carolina. Now, to get those, you're going to need to alter the treaty a bit, but that doesn't bother me too much because I have a feeling this would happen. You notice I've changed all the tonnages. Changed tonnages because capital ships exceeding 40,000 tons. Because I'm fairly sure you could fudge it and claim a South Dakota class was 40,000 tons in standard. You could fudge it. It would be interesting, but you could fudge it. They're all Democrat shipyards. They're all Cree Democrat centers. Remember, let's go back to this list. I told you. What's his key points going to be? Well, you've got Senator Claude Swanson of Virginia. You've got California, Newport News. You've got Norfolk Navy Yard. Virginia. And you got Mare Island, California. So you got North Carolina. And you got Norfolk Navy Yard. There are three South Dakotas split between those. And if we consider those South Dakotas, Montana is 27.6% complete. North Carolina is 36.7% complete. Iowa is 31.8% complete. Now, they aren't the most complete, but in nicest way, Brooklyn Naval, Ship Naval Yard, New York Naval Shipyard, is going to just lose South Dakota and Indiana. Those are the most complete ships they have, barring North Carolina, and they're going to lose on that. And Massachusetts, well, she's only 11% complete. So, frankly, no one's going to worry about that. And they're all going to have 16-inch guns. That's fine for Tillman, because he's now put in a, he's now put in a ceiling. No capital ships beyond 40,000 tons on 16-inch guns. So he's taken all the heat out of the qualitative race. He's taken all the heat out of the qualitative race. And that's what he cares about. He cares about America. And he cares about those elections. He cares about those seats. I would say that he's going to give America six 16-inch gun ships. Think about that. It's going to give them three Colorados and three South Dakotas. Now, you notice I've said Florida and Utah shall also be uh, disposed of. So, USS Florida, USS Utah are gone. 
So basically the four oldest ships that the US Navy considers worthwhile sticking on their actual list of warships in this treaty are gone. Fra Japan now has a limit of well, I would say I'm going to sort of get into this, but if Japan has a limit at this point, and officially they get a limit of uh, this, they get a limit of three hundred and sixty thousand tons. That's a difference. They still got nine ships. That's all they get. But if their limit is 360,000 tons, well, I wouldn't be surprised if they get a Tosa. At least one. Maybe they get two and they get rid of a Congo. That is going to be an actual discussion with Shan. I haven't got into this one because I have been trying to figure this. That would be going far further. And one of the questions I'm going to ask probably from the Long Patrol is, under this scenario, what calculations do you think Japan makes and what calculations do you think America, Britain makes? I think under this scenario, I think Japan might well tra might well trade a Congo class to get to Tosa class, because if you do if you delete a, a Congo, you have eighty six thousand tons on their limit left, and they can get two Tosas. Broadly speaking. Because the Tosas are roughly full, are roughly thirty nine thousand nine hundred tons in normal, so they're going to be below. Not they're going to be below forty thousand tons standard. So you could get two of them if you're prepared to get rid of a Congo. If you're prepared to get a, a sacrifice a Congo, you can get two Tosas. You could also potentially, though, get two Amagis if you're prepared to sacrifice a Congo. Or perhaps a Tosa and an Amagi. Because the Amagis are theoretically 41,217 tons in normal. And I am sure the Japanese would never lie and say, no, 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 that's 40,000 tons standard. So there is a real possibility they get Tosa and Akagi. Considering the earthquake probably still happens. But as I said, that's going to be a question for the uh, for the um, long patrol, not for the light. For the British, it's quite an easy calculation. It really is. Um, I'll get into that in a second, because... We're gonna, if we're putting it to discussion point, we should really be in the likely results. Said, for the Japanese, I have this feeling they might go to both Tosas, they might go Tosa and Amagi. They might replace one of the Congos with an Amagi, they might get one of the, uh, one of the Tosas in service. The British aren't gonna drop any R class, they aren't gonna drop any N class because. In the nicest way, the British have 13 and a half inch gun battleships to drop. And if they drop them. Let me put it this way. If they drop all their 13 and a half inch gun battleships, they can get five 35,000 ton ships and one 40,000 ton ship. Or five 40,000 ton ships. The British might go for roughly of 38,000 tons, and they might have gone for, uh, you know, 
five thirty-eight thousand ton ships. They could have done that, or they could have gone for six ships and five thirty-five thousand ton battleships, and a new forty thousand ton battle cruiser. Who the British? Honestly, with forty thousand tons limit and the ability to build that many ships is what they can do because the British now limit is six hundred thousand tons. Yet. All the 15-inch gunships and HMS Tiger combined add up to 388,950 tons, tons in standard. So that's including HMS Tiger. If you include Tiger in the British load, they only have, they have two, roughly 210,000 tons, 211,000 tons to spend. Okay, what happens if the US if they get that gives the US 1600 ships? That means to get the then the US is going to have to make positions bills. Yeah, I've answered that one. I'm not sort of going into that one. Um, the so the British don't need to drop R class. The British have eight 13 and a half inch gun ships plus Tiger, so nine 13 and a half inch gun ships they can drop if they want to to get them. They don't have before they have to drop any 15 inch gun ships. They have nine 13 and a half inch gun ships to drop. So do not expect Nelson, uh, the R class to go. In fact, in the 1920s, the R class are not that bad. If you look around at comparative ships in the 1920s, the R class are not bad ships. In fact, they're very good ships. They're technically faster than most of the standards. Again, you know, you can all discuss what the options are for the Japanese, but the, for the British, the options are go for five ships, which are all 40,000 tons, or five 35,000 ton battleships and a 40,000 ton battle cruiser. The British have those options. And they could well be F3 star more than F. Uh, oh, right, because if you consider, if you've got 38,000 ton, you could go for five 38,000 ton ships. And so you're still building them well underneath the treaty limit. Um, you know, the British originally build build Nelson and Rodney to thirty three thousand five hundred tons, roughly. So if you if you were adding on an extra four and a half thousand tons, you'd a get them in F three shape and b with the same armor. But we're talking about a lot faster speed. Under this, would the Royal Navy divide them up between the Royal Canadian Navy, Royal, uh, Royal Australian Navy, Royal Indian Navy, Royal South African Navy to bolster those fleets, or would they have to start to scrap them? Uh, yeah, you're still having to scrap those ships. You can't give them away to other powers. That's still part of the treaty. You can't give ships away to other powers. And let's be honest, the Royal South African Navy is not going to do anything with them. The Royal Canadian Navy has a habit of absolutely more uh, treating their ships like, hmm. The Royal Indian Navy is... Uh, well, let's be honest, the British Indian um, governor scenario is very, very anti-having a navy, uh, mainly because it takes away from the British Indian Army. Um, so the only ones who'd actually support it would be the Royal Australians, uh, would be the Australians and f what do they want. And it, you might, in this scenario, if you do retain Tiger in service, you might end up seeing Tiger given to the Australians. Because, especially if they go to six... If they go to five ship route, then that gives them five fast battleships, five Queen Elizabeths, five R's, and then they have the four counter four battle cruisers. If they go the six ship route, you then end up with five fast battleships. Let's call them the Nelson class. 
you'd end up with, or you know, or Rodney, um, you'd then end up with a battle uh, battle cruiser, an extra battle cruiser. So you end up with six more ships. Add that on to the tri five ships already on uh, the fifteen ships already in service. The five five fives, uh, the five no, the fourteen ships in service. The R's, the Queen Elizabeths, and you would end up with twenty ships. So you'd have five a battle cruiser squadron of five ships. Um, a five fast battleships battle squadron, the Rs and the Queen Lizards. The British would be happy with that. Twenty ships, they could mobilize and put around where they need to do. And yes, they could probably get would probably give Tiger to the Royal Australian Navy to operate, because that would be a sensible thing to give them. Um, I don't think Canada really gets something. I think you probably find the Rs spend a lot of time sitting in reserve. Um. Again, that's not a bad thing. It's one of those things we don't seem to... We, we, uh, Cold War has left a legacy of bad taste about warships being stuck in reserve. But actually, it's historically quite a sensible thing. And putting those ships into reserve would allow them to be preserved in a lot better uh, better form. Ah, oh, David Golding. Oh, thank you. Just bought the second edition to, uh, to be a uh, Trials Battles and Thank you. No, good. Just what, been watching our, our Royal Navy night fighting video. We describe no as night fighting assassins. Pretty much, that's what they are in twenties and thirties. World War Two, if the Iron has five of them. Yeah, imagine World War Two if the Iron has six of them. This is the thing. Uh, this is the point I'm making. You know, with the thirty-five thousand ton margin, you can quite easily get six of them. Um. It's well, you could get six vessels of thirty-five thousand tons. So, what I'm trying to make the point here is, going for a forty-thousand-ton ship is not what the British are necessarily going to do, because when they have thirty-five thousand tons, they go for thirty-three thousand tons. They do that to try and keep everything sort of stay stable while still doing the best they can. With thirty-five thousand tons, imagine, imagine Nelson and Rodney. If you're building with thirty-five thousand tons, you could get six of them. Imagine five built to thirty-eight thousand tons. Uh, you know, even with an extra two thousand tons per ship, you could get some really interesting things going on. And the thing is, the Americans aren't going to be exactly six hundred thousand tons. The British won't be exactly six hundred thousand tons. And again, if the British do offer up Tiger, well. That would allow them to get six forty thousand ton ships. And the British can choose what they choose to offer up. To get these ships. The thing is he wants to build sit he wants to complete and will have six sixteen inch gun ships. He wants to build those five ships because those are going to guarantee him elections. That's what his faction's pushing for. They, if they want that, they're going to have to accept what the British want. And the British really want to complete another squadron. So they want at least five ships. Is what they'd arguably like. No, uh, no stuff. And again, you have to remember again, the press was different in those days. In those days, the Times and the Telegraph used to have official naval correspondents whose sole purpose was to go to sea with the Royal Navy and go, go around the world and understand naval issues. They wouldn't, uh, you didn't get the same articles you had today. There was di far different money in newspapers and they would write these measured things and having reserve was not considered a bad thing it wasn't a world obsessed with just in time economics and being ultra efficiency and not having anything any finance wasted and they understood having reserve ships was perfectly normal that's why you have the reserve na reserve naval personnel to crew the reserve ships because in wartime you need a lot more ships than you need in peacetime that's understood and putting a ship in reserve preserves its material and capabilities you need some ships in peacetime, you need some ships in wartime. Some more, you know. It's, it's, 
it's the reality is that there is there is a very different period in 1920s and 30s than we have today. Today, as I've said before, if you had you know if you had ships in ordinary, which means not commissioned, sitting around in ordinary, the n newspapers, the all the t all the things get very upset with you. In the 1920s and 30s, it was considered normal. There were quite a lot of ships in ordinary. A nice way, look at the sheer amount of American destroyers sitting around in ordinary. So look at what happens after World War II. Look at the amount of ships the Americans and British put into reserve, mothball. There is no question if that's a sensible idea. Everyone agrees it is. It's today, it's a, it's a dirty word. Today, it's terrible. It's verboten. But in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, it was sensible. So yeah, if you get rid of Tiger, you could give, you you could give Renown or Repulse to Australia. There is always a chance, but it's unlikely they're going to get a 15-inch gunship. There's a difference between giving Australia a 30 and a half-inch gunship. If you don't want to directly provoke the Japanese, but still have a capability in Southeast Asia, South Pacific waters, Tiger is the suitable vessel to go for. So myself. I have a strong view that the British probably go for the five thirty-eight thousand ton vessels, but as said, you could go for six thirty-five thousand ton vessels. You could go for five thirty-five thousand ton and one forty thousand ton vessel. Um, you could do all sorts of things to muck it around. You could muck uh, the British could muck around, or they could literally just go for. Five forty thousand ton ships, and in then including Hood, they have their six forty thousand ton ships, and they're happy. But if they do that, then they have twelve thousand tons. Le well, about eleven thousand tons left over. The British will be eleven thousand tons under the treaty limits. It's not necessarily a bad thing in the British opinion, and they'd have nineteen rather than twenty ships. Not necessarily a bad thing in the British opinion, but not necessarily a good thing either. So, the thing is, I think the British go for the F... Let's put it this way. This is the fighty form and armoured form. This is the heavier but faster form so if you want to build something which is the most condensed you can build but still heavily armored you build it in Elrod form if you want to build it faster you build an f3 form and that's what i think with extra tonnage i think they go for a faster armed with nine 16 inch guns the really interesting thing comes from of course if they do decide to go for the six ship route And if they go for, you know, battle cruiser veterans, which can go a lot faster. If they go, let's say, let's say they build nine, uh, you know, five of these ships, sorry, based on the sort of this the sort of outline, but, you know, they build some as armored, some more heavily armored, and some as faster battle cruisers. What they might do is they might build the battle cruiser ones with 15 inch 50s. Okay, they might do the 15 inch 50s. Because then that could, uh, they could use the battle cruiser forms to upgrade the rest of the fleet. So if they. Go for 15 inch 50s for the battle cruisers, and they therefore have let you know. It could also be a way they get away with it because if they are building six ships and they're technically supposed to be only building five, and they go, Well, shh, don't worry, don't worry. Um, a, we're going to get rid of Tiger as well, okay, eventually. But also, the battle cruiser, she's, um, she's armed with 15 inch guns, not 16 inch. So we're only going to have five 16-inch gunships. Don't worry. You know we're not no, no, we're not out ranking. We just got we just need an extra battle cruiser for our global trade and global protection. And that then.
can be an interesting scenario because then, of course, you have a 15-inch 50 gun in service and you can start retrofitting to your R's, your Queen Elizabeth's, your Hood, your Renowns, uh, Hood, Renowns. All of those ships could get the 15-inch 50 upgrade. At 40,000 tons, you could keep the same armor as Nelrod and going to fast speed in F3. Yes, you could be going. The F3, these ones could be roughly 30 knot ships. So you could build five 30 knot battleships with this level of armor. That, you, you could just go straight for that and just go, so, Restward, how are you feeling? And Restward going, um, we'd now like to officially cry. Uh, you've got five of those. No, uh, no, uh, Stafford, you wouldn't build them all with 15s. You'd build the battleships with 16s and the battle cruiser with 15s. So you'd still have your 16 inch battleships. Remember, the British do not want to be the only ones without a 16 inch gun battleship because that's the most powerful gun you're allowed. It might be realistically, if you were de dealing with 15 inch 50 versus 16 inch 50, you were dealing with something which is. Ugh, the realities of its quality versus each other is going to be marginal in the, once you're at that sort of level, for, in proportion to that level. But, you know, it's the symbology. We have to have the same size gun as them. So, likely changes for the aircraft carriers. This is where things get interesting, because, again... So, you'll notice I've doubled the tonnage. When you look at the top, the tonnage has doubled. Why have I doubled the tonnage? Why have I increased the Americans' limit to 10 carriers? Maximum tonnage for a carrier is 27,000 tons. Well, if you look down below, you'll notice that they're allowed to build four aircraft carriers, each of total tonnage of no more than 33,000 tons at this point. Four carriers of 33,000 tons. And none of them are allowed guns bigger than six inches. So, the carriers aren't allowed guns bigger than six inches, and they aren't allowed to. You aren't allowed to build. You're allowed to build four, which are big. The uh, which are um, conversions. <laughs> now, at this point, it does become interesting. What exactly happens? Um, again, with the British, with two hundred seventy thousand tons worth of carriers to be able to build. So, if you're actually building ten, that's going to be an absolute dream. Yes, you're increasing it for the Japanese as well. They've now got 162,000 tons, which allows them to build six, theoretically. And the, uh, the Italians and the French both go up as well. But they're not bigger, they're not allowed guns bigger than six inches. Think about it, from, think about it from someone who wants cruisers to be built. Do you want carriers to have 8-inch guns if you want to build cruisers? If you want to build cruisers, who is going to justify it? No one. You don't. If you want the cruisers built, you do not want carriers to have 8-inch guns for anyone to try and justify the idea of we don't need a cruiser to escort these ships, they can escort themselves. That ain't happening. And... Why is he doing this? Again, well, think about it. If you go back to what he wants out of the treaty internally, he doesn't want any ships in Virginia, anywhere like that, to be cancelled. And Lexington class, well... If he goes for those... If he goes for those, he's got a choice. He's got a problem. Because he can't cancel, probably, Lexington herself being built in Massachusetts. That's going to be too obvious to the Republicans. And he's not going to want to cancel Saratoga in New Jersey. Because that's, again, an interesting scenario political-wise. 
So he can't cancel Massachusetts. He can't cancel Saratoga. So Lexington and Saratoga can't be cancelled. They can't be cancelled for lots of reasons. Let's be honest, there's a reason those two ships aren't cancelled in the first place, when all the rest are. They are the reason they are two of those two are chosen over all the other ships in the group. Then there's Constellation and Ranger. They're being built at Newport, both being built at Newport News Shipbuilding in Virginia. They are both, how do I put this, critical assets for a certain senator. If that senator, his key ally in Virginia, wants them, they're going to get saved. And so this is the scenario you've deal you're dealing with now. At this point, the Americans have probably four of these coming along. And they will not have eight inch guns on them. They might have six inch guns. Which is an interesting thing, because theoretically, you could make a 6-inch gun quite good for AA work, even at this time. But also, the likely thing is, they get twin turrets off the Omaha class. And guess what? If Charleston Shipyard is building those turrets and guns, guess who's probably going to get the contract for those 6-inch guns? And tur those turrets. Bravalganism. Ideally, battleships should be built without secondary guns for the same reason. Yeah, the trouble is there's destroyers and things like that. So the reason they get secondary guns to deal with those, if anything, breaks through the cruiser screen. Uh, it's not supposed to break through the cruiser screen, but in case it does, you still have them. And the trouble is battleships are up screen because of that. So you can't usually get away with guns smaller than six inch. Uh, bigger than, you can get away with saying no guns bigger than six inches. You can't get away with saying no secondary guns at all. Uh, no guns like that. Okay, so essentially what Tom wants is jobs for the boys. Yes. It's shameless, but that look through his career, look what he's done. And the whole thing is going to be he wants more cruisers. The Lexington ballast issues will be less. Well, yes, if you're trying to balance something which is only a 6-inch guns up there, and they're only twin 6-inch guns, so they've got 8 or 8 6-inch guns, or 8 8-inch eight guns, you are going to be dealing with a very different tonnage scenario. You might actually be honestly 33,000 tons dead on. <laughs> I mean, I do love it when someone there goes, we are 33,000 tons dead on. Yeah, right. Now, four Lexingtons in the world does actually lead to some interesting scenarios. And if we consider the sheer scale and size of that tonnage, we, you could be dealing with a far bigger carrier force on the US Navy in World War II at the beginning than it had historically. And, as said, the 6-inch gun becomes interesting because, as said, theoretically you can actually make a 6-inch gun into an AA gun. The British don't. And you have to remember the British, you're still allowed to fit these guns on the shit, on the carriers up to 8-inch guns when the British are sticking 4-inch and 4-inch uh, and and inch guns on their carriers. Um, the British do, some of the early ones have casemated 6-inch guns. Very quickly the British get away from it. Uh, Broad your main problem for cruisers in the, in the sort of thing is if you're in a major battle like Jutland, and I'll, exp I'll go into this because it's worthwhile explaining, um, they are big enough to justify battleships using their primary armament, whereas destroyers aren't. So a cruiser could find itself being pummeled by a primary armament of a battleship, whereas it's unlikely a battleship is going to turn its primary armament on a destroyer unless there is nothing else tastier to deal with. There's absolutely nothing else around for it to deal with. So, for that reason, 
you don't tend to, uh, you know, if cruisers get, if you're talking about scenarios like Jutland, etc., which do come up in their minds, and spaces between battleships, if battleships are fighting each other, you don't want to be a cruiser running between the two, because if they lose smoke and aren't sure which is which, they could end up blasting you. Whereas a destroyer can usually get away with it. So destroyers are what your secondaries are there to really take out as a battleship. Unless you're solo, in which case cruisers are also there to be taken out. Uh, Maximus, with larger carriers, might see some try with twin engine torpedo bombers to carry larger torpedoes. Well, you have to consider, Britain traditionally didn't actually take advantage of this because they were worried about their to cumulative tonnage. They didn't take advantage of this because they worried about the cumulative tonnage. Okay? It's 33,000 tons in a 27,000 ton world in a world where the British needed six aircraft carriers minimum. If the British now have a total of being able to build 10 carriers, the British still might not take advantage of the tonnage. Think about that. The British still might not. They might not do the G3s. They might save the tonnage to build carriers later. The, you know, the results you might see is they still might go with Courageous, Glorious, and Furious. And Eagle and, Her e Eagle and Hermes and Argus. Because that's six flight decks. And then they build Ark Royal. They don't need to get her out of service, and you know they might build. They might actually build Ark Royal and a sister, and they might then be further along building the illustrious class and all sorts of things like that. So that's the scenario. Treman Tra does Tillman want more cruisers? Oh, sorry, because of Charles Navy Yard builds them, or is there some other reason? It's um, there are two reasons why actually he likes cruisers, and he does support cruisers. One of them is he believes American trade going around the world needs to be properly secured. And he considers the fact that they haven't been building cruisers to be a problem for this. Again, what's he doing this? Well, he wants to be tra he's trading with the world. He doesn't want to police the world like Britain. He doesn't want to take on that cost. But he wants to trade with the world. And he realizes cruisers are a good way of protecting your trade and making sure it's happening. Um, he's also worried about rec fleet reconnaissance values, which is why he actually originally supported Lexington's and was involved in them. And it's another reason why he's going to push for multiple carriers. Because if you're going to turn Lexington's into carriers, if that's what's going to go through, then he's going to want to have at least four of those. Um, but most importantly, he supports cruisers because they are the bigger ships which can be built in the Charles and Navy Yard, and they can provide ongoing employment. The thing is with destroyers is it peaks and troughs. Destroyers you need for them and you're building them peaks and troughs because they're small ships which can be relatively quickly built. Whereas cruisers are an ongoing construction program. You, have to, you would keep building them. So cruisers offer far more stability of employment for a yard than destroyers because they're bigger ships. So there are lots of reasons he supports a cruiser program. I wonder, would the countries burn more of their tonnage up front, or would they play and save more of their tonnage for later? I think most of them are going to do a mixture, as they all traditionally did. Let's be honest, most countries do not burn their tonnage up front completely, but they do use quite a lot of it. Um, capital ship tonnage is not something you save for later. Uh, the British max out their tonnage, but they keep renewing their tonnage, because they have a lot of old ships they can get rid of, so they keep work cycling through the older ships. And it's the same with destroyers and sort of at every level. The only interesting area is going to be aircraft carriers. And again, I think it's going to be slow build. Because if you consider the Lexington class carriers, they didn't get into service. Well, they actually ended into service in 1927. So even if you do carry them on, they're not going to be in service till 1927. You've got next treaty in 1930. So, frankly, you know, you're probably, with the other two, next two along, you're probably talking about them getting service in 1928. So, you're probably talking 27, 28 before you had them. Rob Bargainism. So, if Charles had a bigger yard, had a bigger yard? Yes. He'd probably be looking at bigger ships. Treyman, why do we get a bunch of US Rangers or a whole fleet of Yorktowns or the rough equivalent in the Imperium? Rough equivalents. Rough equivalents. The Japanese might try for twin engine bombers, but again, how many. What are the Japanese going to convert? Because in this scenario, we've already discussed, they probably get. To, maybe, maybe they get both Tosas as battleships. Maybe they get a Tosa and a Magi. 
Um, there is all sorts of scenarios what they get, but that's going to be the intro. That's going to be the scenario they're going to have to deal with, and what they use for this is going to affect what they can use for the carrier conversions. And for the Japanese, if we consider their tonnage, if we go back to this. If the Japanese, with a total of, well, if we read this, the front Japan gets 162,000 tons. If they go with four 33,000 ton conversions, that's 132,000 tons of their 162,000 tons used. So that leaves them with only 30,000 tons remaining. So will the Japanese want to go for four conversions? Or will they go for three? It's, and, you know, watches that they have three of. Or do they go for, try and go for two? That's the problem for Japan. Japan can have the option of four conversions, but what does Japan actually have out of construction that are four? The Klee class battleships haven't started. They haven't been laid down. They were planning for, but they haven't touched them. The Amagis They were planning for them They were supposed to be bigger and heavier But let's be honest What have they actually laid down of those four? They've sort of got them laid down And sort of starting them But pretty much uh, they only named Magi, Akagi, Atago, and Taiko. Taiko. And let's be honest, Atago and Taiko are not even really properly laid down at this point. Uh, you know, they are... They were still very much on their slipways and very much barely constructed. And if they go for four Amagi's conversions, what happens when there's a, if there's a, the earthquake as there was for historically? If they go for the four Amagi's, then Amagi gets destroyed by earthquake. Where do they get the fourth ship? Or do they not get a fourth ship? Do they not by that point have a fourth ship? Do they only have three? As by default. Excellent. I'm almost hoping for Tillman to live with all this happening. He was very unpleasant and racist even for the time, though. Yes, this is the trouble. There are this is there is an old point that has to be made. Sometimes evil people do good things for bad reasons, and sometimes good people do bad things for good reasons. It's scary either way. It's not exactly nice. And in this case, Tillman is not doing this out of... Well, you can say love America and pride for America and all these things. But mainly he's doing this... he would be doing this as, if you go back through his entire history with Charles and Navy Yard and all the other things. It's all about securing jobs in South Carolina to get his re-election. This is why I say he wins the elections. Would the sub-10,000 ton loophole still exist here? Would the IGN be more aggressive using it? Well, it would still exist, because I haven't changed that part of the treaty, because I don't see why it would change. But why would the IGN use it? You see, the IGN use it when they are worried about getting enough carriers. And yes, they could maybe go for it, but first of all, they're going to try and build other ships. And they've got to, if they're building three... Uh, let's say if, uh, the Amagi's, Amagi's destroyed in the... Um, in the... the Earthquake as she was, and the other three get converted into carriers. If they got those three carriers in the service, are they going to necessarily be trying to pursue the 10,000 ton ship one? Do they have the resources to pursue that, especially when they're also completing two battleships? If they're completing the two Tosas, Tosa and Kaga, and if they are completing, uh, they're getting rid of that, uh, you know, this is the trouble for them.
Also, let's be honest, if Tillman is around for longer, he probably handpicks his successor to be just as focused on the things as he was. Uh, that's one of the troubles for um, the Americans in the passing on of their senatorial experience is that the senators had traditionally at this point actually basically picked their successors. And usually they've been former governors. And so they were already well trained in sort of how to run a political operation, etc. from these things. And they groom them, train them, and then they take over from them. And this was not all of them, but it's many of them. Trump is a whole slew of senators in the nineteen in the nineteen twenties, early nineteen twenties and nineteen eighteen to nineteen twenty, I mean you basically mean as die. Be for various reasons. Um, they're getting old, they haven't done it. And so yeah. They are They're gonna. It's gonna be an interesting. It's a. It's sort of. It's an interesting time if they get time to train up their successors. And I was about to put it with the Japanese. Probably for conversion initially. Then after losing Amagi, they're gonna want a new full-size fleet carrier to back it up. Tosas, about the 1640. They are like toasters, but they are battleships. And cruisers. Well, this was an interesting one. I thought, what's the largest size cruiser that I can fit into Charleston? Probably about 12,000 tons. I have no... no. Des I think in... Again, he's probably still got to concede the 8-inch guns on cruisers. And there's a reason he's got to concede the 8-inch guns on cruisers. Because all the concessions he makes on getting those cruiser guns, 8-inch guns and all those things, are going to look like concessions to the Republicans, Right? So, if he gets, if Tillman's group gets cruisers, they're going to want them to be built to 12,000 tons. Again, why? Because they want a clear blue water between them and the Omaha's, so they can justify building them immediately. And secondly... 12,000 tons is relative to 40,000 tons is about, you know, 35,000 tons for your capital ship on the original treaty, 40, push up to 40,000 tons. Pushing the cruise up to 12,000 tons, yeah, makes sense. Also has an interesting point for the British in that if we consider HMS Hermes, it does take her out of the uh, treaty limits. So she's uh, she's no longer considered in the carriers because she's only 11,000 tons in standard. Also ha would have an interesting effect on the Japanese because you can actually build something of 12,000 tons. And that would pretty much build two slightly more balanced treaty cruisers, but um, theoretically, if they try to pursue them, it could also build, lead to cruisers which are just as unbalanced. And that I have a feeling the British scenario would almost certainly see... Well, if you've got 12,000 tons to play with, if you look at the county class, a little bit longer, a little bit fatter, you could probably make them up to 12, 18, uh, 12 8 inch guns in four triple turrets. And again, that's nothing the British aren't considering. So, it's a 12 gun county class. With the Pensacola class, as we're already discussing them, let's put them up there. Uh, that could be an interesting one. It could again go 12 guns, but let's be honest, the Pensacola class, the criteria for them is they're going to have to be built in the Charleston Yard. So whatever's going to be built is going to be built in the Charleston Yard. So the Charleston Yard is either going to have to be expanded a bit, or it's going to have to, you know, be changed a bit, but uh, yeah, I think you, you're more likely to see 12 gun, 8 inch gun cruiser, 12 8 inch gun cruiser become standard. And the thing is, with 12 8 inch guns as the standard, it's going to be more interesting. It's going to be a lot more interesting. Think about it again from the German perspective in build up to World War II. If the British have 12 8-inch guns on their cruisers as a standard, then the candies are all wandering around with 12 8-inch guns. What's the, you know, what's the prospects for the Deutschland class? When they have 6 11-inch guns versus 
eight eight inch guns, they still consider the counties to have an advantage because of their speed advantage. They're able to set the uh, define the distance of battle and to engage, and they're under strict orders not to engage a British heavy cruiser, especially not full fat counties. Uh, it's bad enough facing an ex HMS Exeter, which is a, which is of course a <clears throat> something weird cut price county, or um, as I tend to call them, ha you know, three quarters the capability. Just the same price. The British government special. Um, if you do have 12 guns as the basis of your fighting capability, I think that standard, the Americans probably standardize on that whole shell and are developing it for a lot longer. Um, so the American construction could be that much further along. The British will probably standardize on it. But again, go back to things like the Germans. They're going to be in trouble. The Italian heavy cruisers are going to be absolutely gorgeous. The French are going to be in a quandary as to what to do. And the Japanese are going to be claiming they can fit 18 guns on that ship. Um... Age of the Dun. The RN is probably going to go quads, six-inch guns. They might go with quads. They might go with five triple, uh, five triple turrets. It's going to be. It would be an interesting thing to see what the British would do. Honestly, with the six-inch guns. Twelve thousand tons is going to give you some interesting values and interesting capabilities. And as said, for the British, it works out quite nicely because it means HMS Hermes is no longer included in treaty limit. For the Japanese, it works out quite nicely because instead of trying to build carriers of below ten thousand tons, you can try and get them below twelve thousand tons, which theoretically you can make far more stable. Or rather, the British have shown you could make one that works when it's at eleven thousand tons. So. One of the things you could also see take place, and this is a thing that could affect a lot of British strategy more than any other, the British could build 12,000 ton count, uh, cru carriers for their, or below carriers for their cruiser carrier role, and could concentrate on building larger carriers for their fleet carrier role. And they, again, might decide to go with purpose built carriers because they can build those up to 27,000 tons. And under this treaty, they can build 10 of them. With, with the of the Americans, I have no doubt that under this scenario, they go for the four, four ginormous, ginormous and beautiful Lexington-class carriers. And that's going to take up 132,000 tons. Of 270,000 tons. Which is going to leave them with 138,000 tons to build the rest of their carriers. Now, depending on how many they decide they can go. Remember, they're allowed 27,000 tons as the maximum they can build. But that doesn't get you five carriers. 132,000 tons. 138,000 tons does get you five carriers. But that's 3,000 tons left unused. If you take them down to roughly, I think it's 24,000 from memory, working this out, you can get six carriers. And if I remember correctly, uh, it's 23,000, no, no, 24,000, that takes 120, plus that is 24. So that's 144. No, it's 23,000, isn't it? 23,000. That gives you 138. Yeah, 23,000 tons. You can get six carriers. So the Americans could well go for six carriers of that design. And if you think about that, the Yorktown class in standard are 20,000 tons. So you could build a Yorktown class, which is 3,000, the displays is 3,000 tons more. And you could get six of them. And 
And again, my strong suspicion is the Americans, if you've got eleven, if you've got up to 12,000 tons and the British are building 12,000, carriers on the 12,000 tons and the Japanese are building them, the Americans start building them as well. And if you've got cruisers, which are 12,000 tons, the thing is they're going to be, they're going to represent their, each nation's focus even more. The Americans start off with scout cruisers, but I think, you know, slightly heavier firepower, slightly heavier armor, and probably more speed. The Japanese are going to be paper-thin armor still, but they're going to have massive firepower and massive speed and massive torpedoes. And... Well, yeah, nicest way, if you've got 23,000 tons, 3,000 tons, you could... 3,000 tons more, you could build a Yorktown with some armor. You could build a Yorktown which is has some well, has a lot more protection. You know, as it is, she has a they have a belt which is two and a half to four inches thick. You could actually give her a deck, an armored deck for three thousand tons. Maybe it's probably not the flight deck, probably not the flight deck, but you could may you could probably build a Yorktown which has an armored deck below the flight deck level. Truman, if everyone is building carriers under 12,000 tons, does a blow that 12,000 tons is not a carrier, loophole still get closed in London? Treat. No, it probably doesn't get, it probably gets accepted, but it's made standardized. So what I'd say is everyone's, if everyone's building them, then they will come up with a category. So instead of it being closed off, it'll be categorized. There'll be a result for cruiser carrier or light carrier or something like that. So it'll be fleet carrier is going to restrain at this level. And then there's going to be a light carrier. Ark Royal could get better subdivision. Well, yeah, because the British, if they wanted, could build 10, 27,000 ton ships. Interestingly enough, Paul, in I was thinking through this scenario with the level of construction that could be going on, etc., and things, it could well reduce the worldwide impact of the Wall Street crash. Because Britain could be constructing ships quite happily to keep itself going. And if we consider the Wall Street crash is 1929. So the first reaction Britain of the British government normally when there's an economic downturn is order the construction of ships. Well, you'd have more shipyards still going because you've had more construction work going through them. But for the British, especially because of those battleships being built for starters, and the real and you've got the twelve thousand sub twelve thousand ton carriers being built as your cruiser carriers slash escort carriers, trade protection carriers. The British would be using those. And you've got your cruisers being built, and also again remember the Americans are going to be building more cruisers because you've got someone who's, the entire idea behind this is and it's going to be perpetuated into their Senate is going to be, we have a cruiser project going on and going as basically a job creation scheme. So you're going to have cruisers being built in America as basically a job creation scheme. Cruisers are probably being built in Britain as a reciprocation as a job creation scheme. And the thing is, for governments, as long as you have constant employment going on, and you have the people, you know, the, the some money circulating through the economy and ships being built does create money circulating through the economy. They are far better able to ride out crashes. They're far able to manage them. The traditional method and British methodology of managing a crash has always been to cut, to cut spending in some areas and increase spending in terms of defence and infrastructure because that can employ a lot of people and can get money circulating through the economy and once you get people employed and money circulating through the economy things tend to recover. Because people who have money buy things. People who are, If people are buying things, then other people have to make and provide those things that they have to buy and have to sell them to them. And that employs more people. So employment begets more employment, and that, mean, that gives opportunities for governments to tax that money. And using that taxes, they can pay bills. So all of this needs to be kept in harmony. And if the 12,000 ton carriers are institutionalized as a institutionalized category, it does create some very interesting things. The argument, the, the the question would be, what do they institutionalize eyes and the mass? And I have a feeling they probably go for the same categories as they have before. So probably Britain would be allowed ten, America would be allowed ten, Japan would be allowed, you know, uh, six, etc. That sort of thing would be how they do it. But again, 
all this, all this creates massive problems for the mustachioed man and fat boy, fun boy. Because the more construction you have for Britain and America and, to an extent, France, the more and Japan, the more trouble you make for Italy and for um, Germany. I'd also say you probably potentially also have more likely have the Soviet Union getting involved in starting getting involved in the treaties because if there is more construction going on, then suddenly it becomes more vital for the Soviet Union to be making its statements in the world. Hey, just funk. Like Madison, Ark Royal could get better subdivision. Yes. She could. Let's be honest. If the British are building 27,000 ton carrier, they can build their Ark Royal of their dreams with all the armor. So she's an Ark Royal size of strike group with illustrious scale subdivision and armor. That's scary for anyone to deal with. Potentially Verdun, potentially Essex is on 45,000 ton midways. You're going to build more ships, so you're going to have more yards of experience in building carriers. And Tillman, uh, Trayman, I wonder if the ramifications on the development of escort carriers on the advanced class of World War II. They have designs that could theoretically dust off for the purpose. Exactly, they could do. They could dust those designs off. They could do all sorts of things with those designs. Hello, Geo Guy. It's um, it's the thing is also Trayman is the fact that they could actually just continue building those designs because if the Americans really get into building numbers of them are just sort of building them in the 1930s when they really get around to building stuff in the 1930s, then when the treaty breaks down in 1936 and no one has cumulative limits anymore because the only people who sign up to the treaties in 1936 are Britain, France, and America. Well, then they can just keep on constructing, and so they can probably build more of them. They already have them in service. Batman Maxwell's. If more aircraft being ordered with all the carriers being built will help the aircraft industry. Exactly. And probably make the case for the fleet air arm being part of the Navy earlier on in Britain's case. I know it's treated as less relevant now with other factors being born, but I still think if Wall Street isn't as bad, conditions for mustachioed failed plane being in charge might not emerge. I The trouble is, I don't think any of this really impacts the German economy. And let me explain why I say that. Because it, it, this is all going to be domestic. This is going to help the economies which are able to do it. And that's going to help them, by having money circulating economies, going to help them procure stuff from abroad. But you have to remember, they go very protectionist during the Wall Street, after Wall Street crash. Pretty much all the economies do. And that's the big problem for the German economy. It is an export-based economy. And that is the big problem with the Depression. It's that the, the markets for exporting stuff dies. And it dies for two reasons. One, because they have less money. But two, because governments are absolutely doing the best they can to make sure all that money... It goes to domestic producers rather than foreign producers. So I honestly don't think Germany gets much of a benefit out of this. It would have a knock-on effect in doctrine, um, especially for the British. If you don't have the scenario work out where you have to, because of treaty limitations and cumulative tonnage limitations, diver diverge your fleet carrying your strike carrier capability... The British changes very great. It changes most in that they have far larger air groups and armor. Um, they probably still the Americans are probably still going to have more aircraft on their carriers and probably still going to have bigger carriers because they're going to have the full thirty three thousand ton ones. And same with the Japanese, but the British carriers are going to be far far more dangerous. And things like Taranto etc are going to be far worse for the Italians and others involved. But it's not all bad. The Italians could get more aircraft carriers in this scenario. And um, they could even have more battleships, let's be honest. 
one of the things I did notice when going through this tonnage limitation and did think interesting here was if you go to the Italians and I am lucky I have a whole <laughs> I have a whole Excel spreadsheet set up with all the tonnages of the Washington Naval Treaty that I can play around with and muck around and do all sorts of things in okay so historically the what the Italians have pretty much 112,900 tons of ships they wish to retain at the Washington Treaty. The Dante Alighieri, the Roma, Napoli, Vittorio Emanuele and Regia Elena, they would really rather get rid of. Okay? So the thing is, under this treaty, they're able to have 200,000 tons of ship. If I'm not mistaken, and I rarely am on this one, especially at 40,000 tons, the Francisco Caracola class, which had a full load displacement of 34,000 tons, not only could they have completed the four ships they had, they could possibly, possibly, with their spare and I do say this as politely as possible. They're spare 87,000 tons. I've probably got three of them through. So you could be talking about an Italian Navy, which has the Francisco Caracona, the Marcantio Colonna, and the Cristoforo Colombo, all in service. In the late 1920s. That's a very happy Italian Regia Marina. It's a very unhappy uh, Marine Nationale. Because <laughs> that it basically, as I've said before, the Navy which wins, the, the Britain, Italy wins the most out of the Washington Naval Treaty because the French get trapped by them. Well, under this scenario, it, it just gets worse for the Marine Nationale because their government is still less than likely to actually spend any money on them. Yamato class is going to be ridiculous. Maybe. Maybe the Yamato class is going to be ridiculous. But also think about it. If the Japanese have been allowed to complete the Tosas. And have been building big carriers. There is a part of me which thinks that maybe the Japanese do not feel the need to go that far down the street. There's also the fact that for all of them there's a limit to what their infrastructure can build. The Yamato is about as the biggest the Japanese can actually build. That's about their limit. And that almost bankrupts them. And if you look at their cons cruiser construction, carrier construction, so much of their construction gets destroyed by it. Mike Gooch, it's only a happy Raging Marina until they meet the six cubes up in hours. Again, you have to be careful about that because I don't think the Royal Navy is going to want to get rid of Tiger. I think they'd like to see Tiger go. They'd like the 20 ships. So I think they not very, they only have five forty thousand tons to play with, or as said, they go with uh, they go five thirty five thousand ton ships and a forty thousand ton ship, or that you can you can play around with things, but you have to think through exactly what they're going to get. They are not necessarily going to respond in a case of we can just get six of these ships because again, if they get six, go for six those sh six souped up nail rods. That's great. But they've also got Hood, which means they've suddenly imbalanced the scenario versus the Americans. They don't want to do that. Which is why I said they could go for five nail rods, uh, souped up nail rods with, of roughly 35, 38,000 tons. And they could go for a sixth ship, which is going to be a battle cruiser. It won't be a G3, it won't be an N3. They're far too heavy. Um, the G3 class. Well, the G3s come in and displace 49,200 tons in normal. There is no way you're getting that down to 40,000 tons. So that's not happening, Geo Guy.
Tina and Ian, if you have any small plan, the more carries to play within the interwar period, they might be made a greater part of Kantai Kesson in the wearing down of the Emma fleet. They may see, uh, see less need for the amateurs. Okay, um... Done a whole video on the Kantai Kesson. The carriers are a major part of the attrition process and a major part of the decisive battle. But the whole attrition process is supposed to happen before you get to the decisive battle. Kantai Kesson is literally just the decisive battle part of it. It's the end part of a whole strategy. And um, it's an interesting strategy. They do have it, but it's also the only strategy they can really adopt. Uh, where can I find info on the four 17,000 ton carriers the Royal Navy wanted? Which carriers when? Night 6 8 3 one Because 17,000 ton carriers... Come up a lot. Um, but I, it, it's not really something the British were actively looking for. And that you are, you, you talk about something which. The, even Madden is not really talking about 17,000 ton carriers when he's seen sea that that's never really the correct tonnage when they're looking in peacetime in wartime that does come up as an emergency build but it's never really looked at as the desired tonnage because uh, you either want armor or you want air group and 17,000 tons provides you with the bare minimum of one or the bare minimum of the other Christmas. Tiger somehow makes it through World War II, gets preserved, Dr. Clark and Drac fight about who gets the first, support, first during the Australia trip. We don't fight about it, we race. Um, let's see. Uh, Sean Horse and Nizen are currently crying, though. Uh, yeah, I, I think, honestly, my scenario, I would think, is 538,000. So, uh, the British go for all one class. Don't go for the battlecruiser route and battleship route. Just go for one class. It's 538,000 ton nail rods. Super nail rods with F3 design and speed. Um, probably 28 to 30 knots speed. And, yeah, in the nicest way... That's not going to do. That's not going to do anyone any good. Um, in terms of fighting them, because you think about it, the Nelson class displaced thirty-three thousand eight hundred tons standard. You've got an extra four thousand two hundred tons to play with, or maybe you push it even more. But you know. Let's say you decide I want to go to 1,200 tons under it. I want to go to 39,000. I want to go to 38,800 tons. So down on 5,000 tons. If 5,000 tons, you can a, as I said, play with those 16 inch guns and have them the uh, have them longer version because you need the longer hull. Remember, length to beam ratio does affect speed. So one of the reasons why you go for the the sort of you know you, if you've got 5,000 tons to play with, you go for the longer hull. And the line out of the guns in that in the F3 formation is so that you you know to take advantage of that length because that's a slightly that's a better firing profile, and you're going to be building longer anyway, so you might as well use the space. And also that allows you to spread out the magazines more. If you think about it, if we go back to this page here, what's wasn't it? Yeah, if you look at them, you can work out very quickly that there's going to be a lot more space in certain scenarios between magazines and you can structure them around you also got more space between engines and magazines in terms of boilers in the f3 design than you do in sort of in Nelson Ronley design 
and you can use that space to insulate the magazines from the heat and that's a big factor again so you know you sort of go with that route uh, i would say getting five of those at roughly thirty-eight thousand eight hundred tons you would have a very interesting capability you would have a very very interesting capability Nice to hear everyone. So they weren't looking at even 10,000 tons of Hermes. Nice to hear everyone. Don't take this the wrong way, because I realize I only have a PhD thesis which focused, and a PhD in the naval aviation in the 1920s and 30s, but having read through the naval architecture and the carrier development in that period, You are talking about the mineral design studies, which I know some people do like to focus on, but at no point were they actually planning on building them. And the 17,000 ton carriers, whenever they turn up, are usually the bottom of the option list. I, this is the bare bones, which we don't want. They often have, they, you can also find designs for maximal carriers of 27,000 tons. And then they start looking at something in the middle for the design profile. So, no. Um, uh, I, d I don't want to get into discussion of books and what other authors have said. I know what other authors have said. I've read them. I know what Roskill says on these things. And I've read Roskill's notes in the Churchill archives. I've also read Roskill's notes about there being a threat of war between Britain and America. And one thing I would say about Captain Stephen Roskill, as good historian as he was, he doesn't understand and never really applies himself to the working of the naval constructors. And... Um, he is the official historian because he's trusted, not because he's necessarily the best historian. And the trouble is, some people have taken his word because he's an authority and he is an official historian. I, I have great respect for him. He was a very good serviceman, and he has, in many ways, has done some very interesting history, which I have utilised. But on the 17,000 ton carrier br idea... No. Just, no. The closest thing which comes out of that project is the 17,000 ton design model for the British to, that they're looking at when they're looking at the generation of carriers which result in the illustrious and the implacables, industrious class, implacable class, etc. Also is, basically is one of the stepping stones which we looked at for Unicorn. But honestly, the problem for Roskill at that point in those things when he's talking about those 17,000 ton carriers is A, Ark Royal, and B, the fact that at no point is there actually a discussion in the third Sea Lord to the, Admiral, to the uh, other lords about an active construction project. They are all part of the design study process. So, in other words, they are worth exactly the paper they are being written on. No more, no less. Take care, Mole's Revenge. Mm, Roskill tended to rely on the people he had a conversation with down the pub. And the trouble is with Roskill, kind of like some of the other sources, is that he is, uh, he reflects the sources he has access to, not the sources who necessarily know what they're talking about. And one of the interesting things I would consider about that is looking through Roskill's list. None of the officers he ever interviewed were third sea lords. He didn't even discuss those things. 
So I guess I cannot write no. <laughs> Look, it's there are design studies. And the thing is, if conflict had broken out, if the treaty system had broken down, and they needed to rush designs into construction, those design studies could well have been the basis of what was designed and implemented. But they're design studies. It's... It's something which navies do. It's like Britain and America, he uses, Roskill, and this is one of the reasons I have the biggest issue with him, is he uses the fact that both Britain and America maintain war plans for fighting the other as a good example of why he thinks there's a chance of war in the 1920s and 30s. The fact is, you're talking about the only peer uh, potential peer threat either nation has. The only power to remotely match into each other, naval-wise, in the 1920s and 30s. For America and the British Empire, our America and British Empire. Literally by treaty. So you as a naval, as a first sea lord, would be remiss if you didn't have a plan somewhere for what happens if shit happens. If something completely out of the blue causes a war between the two nations. You wouldn't do that. It would be completely remiss of you because you'd be sort of going, hang on, they're the only ones who actually pose a viable threat to us. And if you have plans for war dealing with Germany, Italy, Japan, France even, how can you then turn around and go, you know what, we don't have a plan for war with America. It's most strange. So this is the point. Roskill uses those plans as a justification and he uses the fact that there are design studies going on in the constructors for going, the British were going to build 10,000 ton cruiser carriers and escort carriers and 17,000 ton carriers. And you sit there and go... No, they have design studies. And those studies, as said, when they, when they do eventually, you know, the fact that produce, the idea of producing this minimal carrier goes on, goes on, goes on, goes on. And then you have Unicorn produced from that design study, from that section of design study. And then you have the Light Fleet carriers come from that section of design study. So it's a sensible thing to have, this idea of a rapid construction carrier. It's not something which the Navy is ever going to build in peacetime, though. Considering that 10,000 to 30,000 needed for Hermes, how do you get free improved Hermes to 10,000 tons if Hermes couldn't do that? It's a big question, but it's also an interesting design project for a load of naval constructors to work on. Again, think about it this way, Knights of Go for one. Starfleet has a traditional thing called the Kobashi Maru, which is a test which you cannot win. Which is very important for captains to learn when you cannot win. And to learn the lesson that sometimes, no matter what you do, you don't, do, you don't succeed. Various navies, have, modern navies, current navies, have always had those sort of similar tests in officer training. And that's where Starfleet gets it from. Here's the thing. Think about trying to build a better than Hermes on 10,000 tons and think about how many naval architects, naval constructors worked on those projects through the 1920s and 30s. Think about how many of them had to try and work out how to do it. And think about what they learnt doing that. This is the point of design studies. This is why you have the parts of naval constructors doing those studies. Because... It, that's what they learn from doing. And Tashitudra for sure. Hermes wasn't that wasteful in tonnage. And tech did reduce weight, but Hermes was not that wasteful in tonnage. Black Marcus, Canada had war plans for the US. Canada even sent uh, army officers on tours of the US. They gave them holidays to go and wander around the United States and see what see what the roads and everything were like. And the Americans paid for officers to go on tours of Canada. This was during the Depression. It was a great way of picking up and nicest way. I honestly do declare it wasn't because the Canadian officers would drop off alcohol with their American colleagues down south and wouldn't be searched. You know, as they were traveling south, and the American officers would pick up alcohol while they were in Canada. Because remember, this was also the period when America was dry. Unless you reprogram the computer. Well, yes, but, you know, you can't really do that with a design study.
My name's Susan. Wait, the pa you mean the paper isn't worth more? No, because it's been defaced. You need to recycle it for it to be useful. So, a bit late getting into the conversation part of it, but yes, this is the open let's have a chat questions part of it and sort of things for discuss. I hope you've enjoyed tonight's video. I enjoyed it as a topic. Um, I will warn you, tomorrow's recorded video for, based on last Thursday's live is roughly two hours long. So we're off, so this is a root beer. Again, it, no, no, no. Black Lives Matter is far more simple than that. Oh, no, oh, no. You can't look in that. That's official. That's that's national security. That's national security. Yeah, you can cut back on the guns, Tashi Michelle. <laughs> I thought it was a far more interesting topic than I thought it possibly could be. Well, I like these alternate history scenarios because they can teach you a lot about history. It teaches you a lot about the personalities involved, if you look at different personalities and how they might have affected things. It's, it's one of those scenarios where you can very quickly go running off on one, but I had to basically think through everything and justify everything. That's the first rule of alternate histories when I'm doing them on this channel. I, don't, I didn't, you notice, I avoided getting into what World War II would have been like and all the 1930 London Treaty. Because they would all be changed, but you honestly can't predict how they would be changed. You can predict how the Washington Treaty would change, and you can predict, based on those changes, what things might happen in those years up to 1930. Um, but, yeah. So the paper's worth more before it was defaced. Yes. Yeah, it's a butterfly effect. That's a great. On a good news, in a couple of weeks I'm moving over east, so three hours ahead. Finally, I'll have to catch these lies about having to wake up at over 3 a.m. <laughs> Glad to hear that. <laughs> no, coach, you do realise that tonight's discussion will spark umpteen comp competition entries. I'm glad to do so. I'm glad that, Tremon. That's what I'd go for. I. This is the thing. I My PhD is. I'm a historian. But I did my PhD in the War Studies Department of King's College on And the thing about doing war studies, which is different from doing a pure history, is you do a lot of alternate history scenarios because you're trying to teach people to, stir, to study and learn war, the philosophy and practice of war and warfare. And to make them really think, you, sometimes, you have to teach them both the history and teach them the history as well as you can so they learn the history. Because then, once they learn the history, you can then take them and go, Ryan, I'm going to change this bit of the history. How does it affect all the rest? Da, 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 da. And you, then you start the class debate off, and you can have a great seminar discussion with, you know, you have 20 odd students in the room, and they are debating, and we'll get really passionate. And I used to add, I used to add more fun by telling them to do present, having them do presentations at the beginning to present about the topic before we did discussion. And um, some of the students would get into full character. I remember once I had an American student who was absolutely one of the favourite students I've ever had. And he literally grew a beard and was smoking, a, brought in a pipe with fake smoke, even though he didn't smoke. And full tweet, uh, full sort of white southern suit and pa uh, sort of Panama hat he'd found, not a proper one. Uh, and not, not a sort of really period, uh, period hat, but it, it sort of offset everything. And the whole thing was about a debate on the American Civil War and what would have happened if the South had moved their ca not had their capital at in Virginia, instead had chosen to set it up in New Orleans and how that would have changed things. And he presented on that and it started off a wonderful discussion. But he went absolutely passionate. Unsurprisingly, I did give him a first for that because he came in and did that presentation it was an excellent presentation but he'd gone the extra mile he literally spent six weeks growing a beard so it would be perfect for it <laughs> oh. it's the first thing no last night my sister had to go up to an award ceremony which she was her students were some of her students were getting awards so instead of leaving as she wasn't getting back to really late instead of leaving my mum alone in the house late at night and all these things and having to deal with dogs who both of whom had had their um 
worming tablets <laughs> and flea tablets uh, the, the yesterday, I decided it was better to move the live to Friday night. It seemed more fair than leaving her on her own to deal with two dogs going through worming tablets and flea tablets, which happened to coincide. Is there anything in the 1924 Admiralty Plan in Roscoe's British Naval Policy Volume uh, Book 1 uh, that can be trusted if the info on the carriers is wrong? Oh, there's lots of stuff in there which is actually quite good, and it's very good. It's just uh, treat the construction portion with a healthy dose of salt and treat some of the strategic scenarios with a healthy dose of salt. The other problem he has is that a lot of the senior officers who were making decisions in the 1920s and who were involved, even some of the ca some of the key captains who were involved, like Henderson, etc., were dead by the time he was writing it. And some of them didn't leave good notes because of various reasons. Uh, John Giovanni, after Dreadnought, did Navy have plans of what to do with big ships being eclipsed while they were in reserves? It seems that warship generations happened faster near this at the 20th century. Um, basically, if they eclipse while they're in the reserves, then once they're, then sort of the gener, uh, then once the new ships come in, then the uh, ne the previous the next generation after them go into reserve, and those ships get got rid of, basically. But also, you can sometimes you can often find good roles for them. Let's be honest, the quite a lot of the old ships as I've discussed before. The a lot of the um, what I call royal sovereign style battleships. Uh, the pre-dreadnoughts, the major group of the pre-dreadnoughts, were still being used in World War One for shore bombardment, convoy escort, all sorts of things. So you can still use those older ships. They're not; they don't tend to be so outclassed immediately. They can't still be used, but it's going to be for a second line role. Um, Ascro. On a more historical note, what would it take to unfrigate the German economy post war on so they can afford to build carriers early? Uh, you'd have to completely change the Versailles Treaty. And you'd also have to stop the British doing everything they can in the Versailles Treaty to absolutely frigate the... How do I put it? Frigate the ship up in, term, uh, in terms of the German maritime industrial base. Because basically the entire reason the Germans cannot produce ships which are not overly complex and overly heavy for their cap uh, for the uh, overly heavy uh, displacement etc because of it and so inefficient designs really um despite their supposed scores on when you have those you know lovely game uh, those lovely sort of uh, what are their cards called baseball cards sort of style things of top trumps card um of ships and you know they look so good on them but they really aren't once you start looking at them and start going into be below top trumps level actually looking at their capabilities is because of the damage the British used the, the Treaty of Versailles to do. Basically, the French used the Treaty of Versailles to muck up the German economy. The British used the Treaty of Versailles to muck up the German maritime infrastructure and industry, industrial base. And you would have to change that completely. You'd have to have the, the French not muck up the German economy and the British not muck up their maritime industrial base. And there is basically no chance of you get doing that because that's the entire British war aim. Once war starts... Black Max, what can Germany even do in a scenario? Cry. Oh no, they'll do exactly what they did in the historically, because they are too silly not to in many ways. Um, they'll just be in far worse position. Because their infrastructure is their limitation on what they can build. Once you're breaking the treaty and going with the Anglo-German naval treaty and building Scharnhorst and Eisenhower, etc., your limitation is your infrastructure. The same with Bismarck and Turbots. Their limitation is their infrastructure. And they can only invest so much in their infrastructure because they're having to invest in their army, their air force at the same time, and they get they get first dibs. The Navy comes a distant third. Thanks what? Dergies must have been unpressed. Loki had a bath one night. Boy, did I get evil looks. You always do. Bath night is not good. Next one. Oh, New Orleans capital is interesting. It means that the South possibly fighting far more defensively in depth trading space for the time, but Grant specialized in riverine sieges and battles. I know, it's a really interesting scenario to chuck at students. It is a really interesting one. And it also changes certain things because it's far harder for the, Ameri uh, for the American Navy to really do a decent blockade on New Orleans than it is 
closer to the naval bases because they are far, far away. It takes them longer to set up. And so you've got more time to really set up there. And also it might change some of the... Because if you're based in Virginia, that does have an impact on certain other states and where they go, i.e. California. And if you're in New Orleans, you have a different scenario. It also means they're going to set up their infrastructure, etc. They're not going to setting the infrastructure up, infrastructure up in Raleigh, in Virginia. Um, they are probably going to be moving it south further. And that gives them the file safer. It means that they might not get the infrastructure overrun so quickly. Um, Stafford, there are ticks all over the UK. I am uh, well versed in my tick removal tool. Uh, Stafford Johnson, what would an RN officer in the 1880s think of the O class if one was to appear off the bow of HMS Majestic Battleship? Woohoo! We want that! Listen, trade protection aircraft is, is something the British wanted, isn't it? It's something the British had in mind, but also it's a case of the British didn't think you could get a viable one for less than 10,000 tons. They keep doing those studies, but they can't think you can get one for viable 10,000 tons. So whilst for less than 10,000 tons built to a military construction. You have to remember, the escort carriers that are built in World War II are not built to military construction standards. They are something you can get away with building in wartime, when the urgency requirement is to build as rapidly as you can. But you can't get away with building in peacetime, because you're basically building a freighter hull with a flight deck on top. So that's the trouble for the Royal Navy, and for most navies in peacetime, is that you can't get away with building that sort of vessel in peacetime, but you need it in wartime. And that's the problem with 10,000 words. I mean, 10,000 tons. I have another submission. I'm hoping I have a few submissions coming in. Wait. German. German Army and Air Force have the advantage of training in the Soviet Union during the interwar years. They had the advantage of training all over the place in the, in the interwar years. I mean, the German Army and Air Force go ev all sorts of interesting places. We almost famously remember Spain and the Soviet Union, but there are other countries they go and exercise and wander around in too. Nice to If the Dorsetshire was a 9.2 inch armed cruiser, what are the odds the Dorsetshire would have fired eight torpedoes in Bismarck? Uh, uh, Bismarck? Um, well, does she have eight torpedoes to fire? Honestly, being 9.2 inch guns doesn't affect whether you're going to fire your torpedoes. Um, there was a probability they hit before Bismarck rolls over. Well, again, depends when you fire them. Uh, how big are the torpedoes? How fast are the torpedoes? There's lots of factors in there before you can start talking about that one. Um, based on it just being a 9.2 inch armed cruiser. That, what's that changed? How's that changed? Is it still built to 10,000 tons or is it built to 15,000 or 18,000 tons? There's a whole world you have to consider. In the UK, we tend to just go with the tick removal system, and we do have other things we can apply, but you know, we have good vets down in Cornwall. Why did it take so long for the RN to go uh, to re uh, return to the all forward gun layout on Majestics? Because the all forward layout is very effective for producing a design on a fixed tonnage. When you want to produce the maximum within a fixed tonnage, but if you're able to go up tonnage to get the results, to get the capabilities you want, it's far better to have a balanced uh, a balanced hold design. Again, one of the things I find annoying with Alpha um, Adrenals, right? Doesn't matter where I'm hit, if the ammunition goes up, all my ammunition goes up. So I lose all my main gun ammunition. Whereas, actually, historically, the magazines would have been at least split into two, forward and aft, if I've got guns forward and aft. it could I could actually pick, if I picked a maximum subdivision of magazines, they could be split into four. And it could be a magazine for the four gun, a magazine for the, you know, each gun having its own magazine, its own ammunition storage, would not be unusual. And it could have five sh five uh, main turrets, and then have a magazine for all of them, uh, and you know, separate magazines. So an explosion in one 
or one being flooded might not wipe out the others. And I can still keep firing, whereas in Ultimate Adrenals it doesn't have that. So if you think about it, if you have an all forward gun ship, you A, have the most magazines on top of each other, all them, whereas if you have fore and aft, it's you have that divided. If the Soviets are included in London naval treaties in this scenario, how will it affect things in the Baltic and Black Sea? Who knows? That depends on where the Soviets come into. And you're forgetting the more interesting thing is Japan, which of course doesn't trust the Soviets even more. And there are all sorts of problems with that. America and Britain trusting the Soviets. So does the Soviet Union come in as the equal of France and Italy? But the Soviet Union wouldn't want to accept that. They'd want to be the equal of Japan. Well, Japan won't accept that. Do you end up needing to add it, change the entire ratios? Adding in the Soviet Union causes a huge, huge spanner in the works. Because where does the Soviet Union sit? Is Japan going to allow themselves to be equal strength to the Soviet Union? Yes, it does mean, it does mean the Japanese will still be strong on them. But because the Soviet Union will have to spread their fleet out in the Black Sea, the Pacific and the Northern Fleet. But Japan doesn't like the idea of being the same strength as the Soviet Union because they fought a war against them and they're fighting others against them. So this is, you know, the, the, Soviet, does the Soviet Union wants to be the same strength as Japan when they have to divide their navy between four fleets. This is an entire nightmare scenario. And it's, again, did it accept the same strength as Japan? As Japan? Well, Japan won't be the same strength as the Soviet Union, but the Soviet Union might not accept the same strength in terms of numbers as Japan's accepted. So it just blows up. That, that causes a whole sorts of fumble on the naval treaty. Take care, Anga. Look after the catty. That's a great. My fluffy princess cat gets a monthly drop on, drop on flea worm treatment. Hates everyone for three days after. Better than a tablet-based one, so trying to give a pill to cat is a nightmare. See, with my dogs, all I do is wrap the, pee, uh, the, the, the pills in ham and cheese. I know it's not necessarily the best idea, but it works. Okay, they eat it. And just go, chuck it up there. Oh, it's gone. And they go, oh, did I have my pill? Yeah, but you had ham and cheese, so you're happy. Ticks. The, uh, were, have been all, all over Europe for a long time. The Soviets trying to build those car battleships of carry so hilarious, though. Yeah, it'll be. A the thing is, though, that the, the problems will be caused in two levels. One, there'll be what they actually, what they're allowed by treaty, which will be a whole fight, and then there's what they actually build. And let's be honest, the worst sufferer in all this is going to be Germany. Because if the Soviet Union builds anything, anything at all, suddenly the German Navy, ha they, they have to be, what happens? Do they go out to try and surface raid on the British if they build their four ships, their three ships they actually get, no, two ships they have by World War Two uh, by, by the time sort of 1940-ish in World War Two. Uh, you know, the Charles and Eisenhower, then they have Bismarck come in later and then they have Tirpitz come in later than that. You know, in the nicest way, and by that point, one of those uh, Bismarck's pretty much sunk, uh, have been sunk by the time Turbots is available, and Neiser now is in massive maintenance, massive refit going on, trying to upgrade other 15 inch guns and all sorts of things. So, you know, realistically, the, the Germans never have more than two ships available. If the Soviet Union has four, even moderately modern, and remember, we I have done a video about the Soviet Union in the 1930s and their plans for battleships. I did that not 20, Christmas 2022. Uh, Soviet Union Navy videos. Uh, the, the thing is, they're, it's wonderful ideas. Some, some of them are very similar to the Nelson Rodney design. If they actually build any of them, that's the nightmare for the Germans to deal with. They're now, now their battle fleet, they have to build, they have to put the money in to protect themselves against the Soviets. And that frees up the Royal Navy. It's just... 
It's a win-win scenario having the Soviet Union, uh, Soviet Union come in. It causes the Germans nightmares. It causes the Japanese nightmares. Causes everyone to have to build more ships. It just—it's a win-win scenario for everyone who loves naval history. <laughs> yes, nice to go, everyone. Unicorn would make a good trade protection uh, uh, carrier. Actually, I've seen a video on the frigging attack boats. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. Think it. I remember doing their boats. Oh, the Soviet Union's attack boats. Their torpedo boats. Oh, that was a fun video. <laughs> it was a fun video. And here it comes. And you thought it couldn't get any worse. Meet the next generation of Soviet torpedo boat. And it. <laughs> oh. It's just. Oh, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful, beautiful idea. It really is. It's this is joyous, joyous time, and um, yeah, frankly, yes. But the Soviet Union getting involved in the London Treaty, I, I think, I'm I'm just going to check Patreon because I think that might be one of the of the topics uh, that they've actually suggested. Uh, that patrons have actually suggested they're actually voting on. Yeah, come on, work for me, patron. Work. And let's see, we've got the vote currently live as we speak. And currently in the front is Star Destroyers. They've got 13... What would a Star Destroyer look like? It was designed by the 1938 US Navy, Royal Navy, Kriegsmarine, Imperial Japanese Navy, Ranger Marina, and Soviets. That's going to be a fun... That could be a fun one. And do we have the Soviet Union on there? I'm sure I, I thought it was up there. It's over there the last month. Uh, da -da 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 -da. I don't think we do, actually. Looking around... Uh, we have the Congos at Jutland is on 8. We have on 12. Ah, 12 votes. Um, Michael 66, down the bomb. Stalin's 1930 London Treaty. Stalin sends out a diplomatic note saying the USSR wishes to join the naval treaties. What happens? And that's just... I've been looking at that one because of that topic keep coming up. And that's... That's a fun one. I mean, literally, that is... That doesn't require me working out how to use AI to try and do some designs. And I have to say, with the nineteen, with the the whole Star Destroyers, I have to I have to work out either how to use AI or someone has to offer to help me do with the designs and the artwork for that. It's just, it's just the issues it creates. There's the issues it creates at the level at which they when they're making the diplomatic agreements and they've got the theoretical, and then there's the issues they create if they build anything. <laughs> oh. Oh, good lord. And the fact is, if they are building them, it, this, I will say this, look, if the Soviets actually build battleships, okay, if they did actually build them, and they do theoretically have the yard capacity to do it, and the relationships with the Italians, and to an extent the British and the Americans, they did at various points consider ordering ships from the British and the Americans, so they have relationships out there they can get information through. If they did actually build them, they would build them domestically. They would probably take ages to build, but they would, if they start building them in the early nineteen thirty, in nineteen thirty, London Naval Treaty comes through. They're part of it. They start building nineteen thirty. They're in service by nineteen thirty nine. They are definitely in service by nineteen thirty nine. They've got some in service, and who knows what they are? But they'll probably also be working a lot better. Than historic, than historic work. Because I have the when they're building them, you're going to build the infrastructure to support them, which actually would mean you'd be able to support things like the Royal Sovereign. I'm glad you're spoiling it, Jess Alinger. It's always nice to spoil them. Spoil an old cat, also old dog. That's what I tend to do. 
Uh, I tend to carry mine around more the older they get. Lesser and Weller Deutschlands would suffer if they ran into an HMS at Unicorn based trade protection carrier and her escorts. Yeah, and you can argue that was actually a secondary role of Unicorn. Unicorn and Assisted Secondary Role was trade protection. You can argue that far more than any other job there for them. Looks like an O-Class. Look, an RN Star Destroyer... That's going to be really interesting, because Star Destroyers are part carrier, part capital ship. So, it is going to be interesting which way they go. Hello, Shook Paul. Honestly, the Star Destroyers, the Imperial ISDs, might look most like the actual um, the German the German ones. They, they they might look the most like it because honestly, I do swear the ISDs are are modelled on German design. Um, the interesting thing is going to be I, I'm going to consider it sort of the Venator ISD paradigm and some of the other Star Destroyers, and which is going to be the basis for them because there are several designs of other Star Destroyers available. And some interesting ships with interesting capabilities. So if that one will get it, yeah. Currently, those are the two on 13 and 12 votes. But there is all the way till Sunday to decide. And there are lots of position. You can all vote for them. Please don't vote for the back garden shed. I, I, I say that in the nicest way. Because honestly, uh, that is just colossal. I do love the way my favourite one. My favorite naughty little dirty, uh, my my sort of naughty secret one, which I have done a disturbingly large amount of work on for one, which has never got it, including working out which town class cruisers would have survived, is the Mail 66 is um, 1938. Hanmar Henderson is on an inspection tour when he finds four pristine town class 19, uh, cruisers suddenly sitting in a yard somewhere. What does he do? And in 1938, if you find four town class sitting there, you use them. Do better. Not all Star Destroyers have to have hangers. They don't have to have hangers, no. And there are certain navies they won't have hangers on. But there are some navies they will do. And let's be honest, you can you can have fun with different navies or that. So, for example, the Italians wouldn't have hangers. And the French one would be a light Star Destroyer. And the Soviet one would be one which is belching smoke everywhere. And sort of things. Uh, British Star Destroyer might look like the later Venator design, where the aircraft come out the side instead of the front. Probably, with the guns mounted centrally. Sound electrician noise is coming from everyone. Alright, so um, I'm going to say thank you very much, everyone. Uh, what have we got coming up next week? We've got a conception, operation, and conclusion of the Europa and Ge uh, Europa and Giuseppe Maragala, which is hopefully going to come out on Tuesday, because hopefully, hopefully, I'm not going to spend the first three days having conversations with, well, A, going off and doing some TV recording, which was a lot of fun, but also B, going off and dealing with a lot of very weird estate agents, etc., and sorting those things out. And, um... Yeah... It's a it's an interesting time. I I hope you've enjoyed tonight, tonight's video. I hope you've enjoyed tonight's discussion. And I'm sorry it started late, but as I said, I was checking my maths. It's going through my Excel spreadsheets and checking all the maths of, of it. Don't worry. Hello, Senator Canera. Thank you for coming along. Thank you, DG40. Thank you, everyone who's been here. Thank you, everyone, for admining. Paul from Chicago, Stafford, Melanie, Dan, uh, everyone who's been on here. Thank you. It's always nice to have you all, and it's always nice to have your help. Thank you, everyone who's been chatting away. It's always nice to have people, and people. thank you for chatting, for those people who've been chatting away for the first time. Again, it's really nice to have new chatters. It's always nice to have people watching the channel, and um, because YouTube likes to tell me off about this, because apparently I don't do it well enough, or do it enough, and they said there should be a certain spike when you say this in your viewership, and I go, why? Why would anyone want to watch that section? But apparently they, some people do, and apparently there's supposed to be a spike. But... If you like, please like the video. Please like it. Please share it. Maybe consider subscribing if you'd like to see more. 
All the buttons, I'm told, are down there. And there's also a button which if you want a membership, which is if you want to be one of the people who are in green in the chat, who have, or occasionally, I think the blue ones also have access to it, they have access to emojis. The blue are the admins, the green highlighted people are members. And they have access to all sorts of emojis which are special to the channel, which the more members I have, the more emojis I can I have to come up with. And apparently I'm supposed to come up with two more as we speak, and I am working out ideas for them. Um, I was considering trying to nick the King's College um, emblem as an emoji. I'm not sure whether you'd all enjoy the emoji, but I enjoy that as an emoji. And, um, oh, speaking of that, my PhD thesis should be actually visible on the website at some point soon, and should all be fine and f visible, which means I won't have got it published before it's become unembargoed and visible, but, you know, life happens, and I'll see what happens with that at some point. But, and if you want to support the channel in other ways, other than sort of membership down there, there's also Patreon, where we were discussing earlier, you can go and suggest topics and vote. That's how I run it, mainly because my friend Drak NFL, if you watch his channel, you will know his patron questions videos are absolutely colossal and he just gets more and more questions and he gets more and more worried about actually delivering all the questions and doing it all properly and doing all the research and making sure it's all done to the high quality standard his patrons and my patrons all of you deserve so i have to say having seen that with my friend i cheated i made mine a two-stage process in that the patrons suggest the questions for lives and there's a full live discussion and a long patrol video attached to it that will be done for that question but I also add in a, these are your suggestions, boom, and then all the patrons get to vote. So on which ones go through. So if you don't feel like suggesting questions, you can still vote. And that's the important thing. So you can feel, feel part of, as involved as much as you like. You can suggest topics or you can just vote or you can do both. You know, and I always make it multiple choice, so you can vote for as many as you like. So hopefully the ones which really do have the most people interested in come through and they are the ones I select and I, 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 I go away. And I do at least two of them. If there's a tie for second place, then I do three, and I rework my schedule to add in a third. But, you know, that's through Patreon. And there's also Kofi up there for those people who wish to feed my iron brew addiction, which basically is what I survive on. Uh, without the caffeine in iron brew, I honestly would probably stop functioning. But thank you very much for your support. Thank you very much for watching, and hope you enjoyed. Let me say, I'm worried. If I press the subscribe button, it would unsubscribe me. Then... If you're already subscribed, say subscribe. But please like and share the channel. And like and share the videos if you like them. It really does. Uh, one thing I will say, YouTube really does respond. The algorithm seems to really respond if people are sharing your videos. One of the things that comes up in some of the uh, analytical results is your videos have been shared more often than last, uh, last month. More often this month. People are sharing your videos more often sort of thing. And um, so that, I think that really does affect the, the algorithm. So sharing the videos on Social media really does help your the people you like on YouTube. Um, also, membership numbers. Membership numbers and sharing videos seems to be the big things. Likes. Uh, honestly, I'm a bit unsure with likes and dislikes actually have any have any effect other than the engagement. I think that has an effect on YouTube, but it's I don't think it honestly takes away for dislikes versus li likes. Um, but I, I prefer more likes myself. I, I do like likes because it suggests I've actually delivered well on the topic. Uh, but, you know, if I haven't, then tell me and I'll try and do better next time. Uh, but the thing is, what I do know really do, uh, do see really seems to affect the algorithm and the videos which do the best and get the widest reach are the ones which recruit members, uh, where new members join up for them, and the ones where people share them on social media. And those do really well. So thank you everyone who's doing that and thank you everyone for your support of the channel. You're rambling. Thank you. Well, yes. But, you know, hey ho. Thank you very much, everyone. And I will be on Discord in a few minutes. I'm just going to have a bit of a comfort break and then I'll be chattering. Also, commenting. Commenting does it. Commenting is always good, but I tend to work well on. Uh, I, 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 do, I tend to do commenting, um, fine with commenting, that the fact, the fact most of my topics do engage quite a few comments anyway, which always helps, hopefully. Thank you. Likes do help. Engagement does have an impact. Please don't think your liking or liking and and psychic engagement doesn't have an impact. But I think it doesn't have as much impact in the algorithm at the moment as sharing does. Um, and to an extent, it basically goes sharing. Memberships are sort of the top level of 
the thing that impacts the algorithm, and then it goes commenting, and then it's liking and disliking, and then it's just actually watching the video. Yeah, counter dislikes can do counters the same, just the same as likes. It is weird. It is weird and confusing. Thank you, Sharon, and um, it all counts as engagement, and you choose the logarithm. Thank you, Sharon. Take care, and hope to see some of you on the Discord for a chat. And there's a link to the Discord server down below. I'll be in the general chat in a bit. Take care. Ba da da bum 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 bum.